Hey, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to be here with you tonight. A lot is happening as we speak. History is in the works. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. I'll tell you what is happening right now as we speak. I'll also give you the necessary background. It's going to be a wild night, so let's go. Spoken of the American century, I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything would be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Welcome, 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 everybody. So glad to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Uh, we are going to talk about what's happening. Um, so the way this works, for those of you who may not be familiar with these live streams, I give my opening remarks. Uh, and that's about world news, events, etc., then from there, we do a roll call. We find out who is on the other side of the camera, who's watching. Then from there, I answer your super chat questions for the rest of the night. So if you have something you want me to talk about in the second half of our show, you're watching here on YouTube, send me a super chat. You're watching on Rumble, send me a Rumble rant. You're watching on the Rockfin, send me a Rockfin tip. Uh, but the second half of the show is just me responding to all of you. And the last couple of nights, it's gone a long time. I've been given long answers to questions, and it's been great. So keep it coming, folks. Get me talking. Uh, use me as your consultant on world events. Uh, I am here to engage with all of you. This show is not just me talking. If I just wanted to talk, I would film it and upload it afterwards. It's about you. It's about the audience. It's about the conversation that we have in the community that we have here. I'm already seeing familiar faces in the chat. Uh, we love the work that we do here. This is a a collective product. These streams are very much a collective product. Speaking of which, for those of you uh, who are anti-imperialist, uh, if you'd like to join us, we are having a national Center for Political Innovation gathering in the U.S. state of Vermont. Uh, and that is coming up. Uh, that gathering uh, is, is coming up. Um, hold on. Hold on. Just got to, got to, get everything in order here. That gathering is coming up April 26th through 29th. Um, let me just share my screen here. There we go. All right. Yes, that this is our national gathering, uh, our four-day educational workshop. It's called Out of the Movement to the Masses. It's in Vermont. Uh, the link for the invitation uh, and the uh, registration form is here. So if you would like to join us for four days of socialist education in the mountains of Vermont, we would love to have you join us. It's going to be a great four-day workshop. So please join us. Um, you know, we got Samuel. He says he's going to be the new recruit at the gathering. Glad you're going to be there, Samuel. I hope you already registered. Um, and if you haven't registered yet, I'm dropping the link on Rumble. Uh, I'm dropping the link uh, on Rockfin. Uh, and you can also, uh, you can see the link down below in the description. Uh, the event is open. Uh, we generally, you know, we, we do have to have you register. We want to talk to you before you come, uh, but that's happening. So just wanted to remind everyone of that. Now, quick reminder, the way we do things here, opening remarks about world events, what I'm going to talk about for tonight. And then from there, we do the roll call. I call folks out as I see them, names and locations, names and locations. And then from there, uh, I answer your super chat questions for the rest of the night. So send in the super chats. Give me something to talk about in the second half of our show. I'm going to jump right in to my opening remarks for tonight because a lot of exciting things are happening. And I don't think people realize the gravity of what's happening. So 
I'm going to jump into my opening remarks. Folks, the supreme leader of Iran, uh, Khamenei, who is the leader of the Islamic Revolution, he's not the president of Iran. He's like the pope of Iran. He's the religious leader. The president is Riazi, Ibrahim Riazi. He's the elected president. But the supreme leader is the leader of the Islamic Revolution. He's uh, the person to whom the Islamic Revolutionary Guards are accountable he is the head of the Guardian Council, and he is the guy who guides Iran's revolution to stay true to its Islamic, anti-capitalist, and anti-imperialist principles. Supreme leader Ali Syed Khamenei, the Grand Ayatollah, he has a Twitter account, and this is what he just tweeted, and I will show you this, right? And this is not a stupid Donald Trump tweet. This is from the Supreme Leader of Iran. This is what he just tweeted. With God's help, we will make the Zionists repent for their crime of aggression against the Iranian consulate in Damascus. That's what he just tweeted. But he didn't tweet it in Farsi, Persian, the Iranian language. He did not tweet it in Arabic, the language spoken by many of the countries in the region. He did not tweet it in English, as he often does. He tweets in English. No, he tweeted this in Hebrew. He tweeted this in Hebrew, folks. As Jenny Lynn says, we know who he's talking to. This tweet came in Hebrew. Um... That's a pretty big deal. We will, with God's help, we will make the Zionists repent for their crime of aggression against the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Now, for those of you who maybe haven't been paying attention to the news or, or have seen American news that covers these things up, um, a couple days ago, Israel bombed the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Now, the Iranian embassy, a diplomatic mission, which is protected by all kinds of international treaties, was bombed by Israel in Syria. And seven Iranian officials were killed, possibly more than that, including a top Iranian general. Now, this was a complete violation of Syria's territorial integrity, and it was a complete violation of Iran's territorial integrity. They not only attacked another country, a country that is not attacking them, Syria, but they also attacked an Iranian diplomatic site in that country. This is a completely illegal act by Israel. And this comes on the heed of Israel murdering a group of medical volunteers, right? We remember that there were some medical volunteers, um, you know, that, that were also recently ruthlessly murdered by Israel. So Israel is on a killing spree at this point. They are just breaking international law left and right, trying to provoke all-out war with Iran. Uh, that's happening right now, folks. And we just now have this tweet from the Supreme Leader of Iran saying something's going to happen. But that's not all. That's not all. Now, earlier today, it was announced that people living in Tel Aviv, in Israel, have started getting into bomb shelters. Tel Aviv is the city that is, it's it's treated as Israel's capital by those who do not recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which is the right move. Uh, Israel thinks Jerusalem is their capital, but the rest of the world says Tel Aviv is their capital. Um, so photos came out that neighborhoods in Tel Aviv, the people are getting into bomb shelters. They're sheltering, and they're getting ready. Right, That's from Tel Aviv right now. There are Israelis that are in bomb shelters. However, and then this video that I'm about to show you just came out in the last couple hours. Um, this is from the Israeli city of Haifa. Right, The Israeli city of Haifa... There's a traffic jam as people are piling to get out of the city. People are piling to get out of the Israeli city of Haifa. 
there is a big traffic jam. Look at all those cars because they know something's coming. And to top it all off, GPS, right? Global positioning system. You all know what GPS is. If you drive, you've got a GPS in your car. GPS has been jammed for all of Israel. Suddenly, GPS don't work no more in Israel. Israel somehow magically turned off GPS right now. Um, and the reason that Israel has turned off GPS, we can assume, is because they know that there is a drone attack coming. And that's what all the reports here are indicating. There's a drone, a drone attack on Israel imminent. Iran is going to strike Israel at any moment. Now, this is big. This is very, very big. But what, I mean, what would any country do under these circumstances? Right? I mean, Iran just had its embassy in Damascus blown up. Iran just had its top general murdered inside of an Iranian mission. Um, Iran has taken hits from Israel and the United States for years. They, Qasem Soleimani, the hero of the Islamic Revolution, was killed. Iranian Iranian soldiers have been killed. Islamic Revolutionary Guards have been assassinated. Iran has been taking hits for a while. And now, at this point, the Israelis blew up the Iranian embassy, the Iranian consulate in Damascus, and they killed a top Iranian general who was inside the consulate. At this point, Iran has said, all right, all right, you just, you, you kept pushing us, you kept pushing us, and you kept pushing us, and you kept pushing us. And um, we're going to respond. Now, Israel says that they have the right to do this. They argue. Because they claim that Israel funds Hamas. So, or that Iran funds Hamas. And so, therefore, Iran is responsible for the October 7th attacks. And so, them murdering Iranians all over the Middle East, violating territorial integrity of various countries, that's all okay. Well, first of all, does Iran give support to the Palestinians? Absolutely. It supports uh, the Islamic Jihad in Palestine. It supports Hamas to some degree or other, even though Hamas doesn't share their religious beliefs. But there is absolutely no evidence that Iran was involved in planning the October 7th attacks. Iran was just as surprised by October 7th as Israel was. Right? They, they didn't know it was coming. There's no evidence that Iran planned October 7th. They wouldn't do that uh, because they're not, you know, they don't have that kind of relationship with Hamas. Um, Iran supports what the Palestinians did on October 7th. And, you know, it, it does fund the Palestinians to some degree or other. But the idea that Iran is responsible for October 7th, that's, that's, not, that's not logical. It doesn't add up. A lot of countries give aid to Hamas, right? Uh, you know, Hamas's headquarters are in Doha in the United Arab Emirates. Right? And, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia gives support to Hamas. Hamas gets support from Qatar and Turkey. And, and many, many countries around the world give Hamas some kind of financial support. Um, all of those countries are not responsible for October 7th. And Iran is not any more responsible for October 7th than, than any, any other country that, that supports the Palestinian resistance. So the idea that Iran is responsible for October 7th, and so therefore Israel has the right to murder Iranians in Syria, murder Iranians in Iraq, murder Iranians in other parts of the world, Israel has the right to violate Syria's territorial integrity. Israel has the right to destroy diplomatic consulates. Doesn't, doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. And the United States, it won't condemn what Israel did, but it's not even trying to say that what Israel did to Iran, to the Iranian consulate, is justified because there's no... There's no legal basis for this. An act of terrorism happens in your country. And you argue that the terrorists 
are somehow possibly linked to some other country. So you then blow up that country's embassy in another country. No, no, no. There's no legal basis for any of this, right? Um, you know, no legal basis for any of Israel's actions. Israel's attack on Iran was a huge violation of international law, just like their murder of the aid workers. Um, now, another bit of information is we understand that the Israeli embassy in Azerbaijan has just been evacuated. All right, Azerbaijan is between Iran and Russia. It is it is Azerbaijan. It's a it's a country, um, and apparently that that country does have diplomatic relations with Israel. And Israel has just evacuated its embassy in Azerbaijan. Israel has turned off GPS for all of Israel. GPS doesn't work in Israel. In Haifa, people are fleeing to get out of the city. And in Tel Aviv, people are sheltering in bomb shelters. Shit is about to go down, folks. Shit is about to get real. Shit's about to get real, folks. I I don't quite know how to explain that to you. The fact that U.S. media is not like on overdrive right now, the fact that President Biden isn't on TV addressing us, um, that's a problem. Because you do realize that if Israel is struck by Hamas, the United States has an understanding with Israel that they're going to protect Israel. And at this, at that point, World War III starts. Uh, this is we are on the brink of World War III here. Now, I I really hope, for the sake of the global community, that somehow Iran's response does not provoke World War III. That's what I would really like. I would like somehow that Iran can maintain its credibility, do what they have to do, what any country would do under these circumstances, and not have the result be a nuclear war. But this situation, I mean, what is Iran supposed to do? And, and please don't tell me that Israel bombing the consulate in Damascus, please don't tell me that was Israel defending itself. Give me a break. I mean, Israel had absolutely... No right to do this. They're already bombing the hell out of Gaza. For the last five months, they've been murdering people in Gaza. They just murdered a bunch of medical workers in Gaza, right? And now they've been bombing and killing Iranians. Now they blew up the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Iran is going to have to retaliate. If Iran doesn't retaliate, it loses its credibility as a country. Um... So Iran is going to have to do something. But what Iran does, how does Iran respond, not lose its credibility as a country, and nukes don't go off, right? Because Israel has nuclear weapons. The United States has nuclear weapons. Russia and China that are aligned with Iran have nuclear weapons. I, I mean, I am, I am genuinely worried about the fate of humanity tonight. Um, and I mean, Iran has to do something and, and you can tell, you can say, oh, Caleb, you're sympathizing with terror. I'll give, shove it, shove it. Iran is doing what any other country could do. Could you imagine, right? If, if an American embassy was blown up by some other country and seven Americans, including a top U S army general was killed inside of it. Do you think that the USA, and it was done by a country, not a terrorist group, a country did this and openly did it. Do you think for a minute that the United States wouldn't retaliate? I mean, any country in this circumstance has to retaliate. Iran has to retaliate, okay? There's no way for Iran not to retaliate, okay? there's It's just Iran is going to retaliate, okay? And the thing is, I, I don't know what Iran is going to do. I mean, Iran, drone attack is what I'm seeing everywhere. People are expecting an Iranian drone attack 
to happen in the next few hours. Um, you know, I don't know what Iran is going to do, but Iran's going to do something. Um, but what I do expect is that American media is going to go into an overdrive about, oh my God, these poor Israelis were killed. If there's anyone with an American passport who dies, oh my God, Iran murdered an American. It's like, guys, you do realize where this came from, right? That, it's just like with the war in Ukraine. They call it Russia's war of choice. Their unprovoked invasion. Uh, uh, do you know anything? I mean, and that's how mainstream media is. Things just fall out of the sky. And when Iran retaliates, and that's why they're not talking about it right now. Because when Iran retaliates, they want to make people think that Iran just randomly attacked Israel. And that's not what happened. Right. This this was if there's ever been a response from a country that's been militarily provoked, it'll be Iran's response. Whatever Iran is about to do is probably the most the most provoked. I mean, Iran has been pushed and 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 pushed. And if Iran doesn't strike back at this point. I mean, they have to. They have no choice. And you need to tell that to your friends. And you need to tell that to your co-workers and you need to tell that to the people you know. Iran has no choice. They have to respond, right? And you say, oh, it's a terrorist country. And I'm sure as soon as suddenly U.S. media is going to discover that this is happening, as soon as some Israelis die, especially if any of those Israelis also have American passports, and the violins are going to come out and we're going to hear, oh, my God, the terror. And, and it'll be just like October 7th all over again, except. Anyone who knows anything about the situation knows that this was not random. This was not unprovoked. This is, Israel went out of their way. And we know why. And it's because this is Netanyahu's only hope for staying in office. Right? I, I mean, and, and that's the thing. Netanyahu is in political trouble in Israel. And, and the war in Gaza is continuing and the whole world is condemning it. The USA finally had to let a UN Security Council resolution condemning what Israel is doing, calling for a ceasefire to go through. The only way that Netanyahu can stay in power in Israel is to provoke an all-out war in the Middle East. He needs it bad. And, and everybody knows that. And so everyone's been trying not to respond. Everyone's been trying not to respond to Israel's provocations, but they pushed it too far. They pushed it too far, right? I mean, they just killed an American aid worker. And where's the media crying for him? Where is the media telling us his life story and all of that, right? I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's so, the double standards are ridiculous, but Iran is going to have to respond to this. Um, Iran is going to have to respond. And, um, we're going to have to see what happens. I mean, I told you what's currently taking place. And um, the whole region's on high alert. People are evacuating. Um, shit's getting real. Shit's getting real. Um, so I'm going to do something I don't normally do. Um, I am going to put some Irish music on. We're going to take an Irish music break. And then I'm going to talk more about world events. The... The opening remarks tonight are, are truncated. I'm going to put some traditional Irish music. This is called, it's a song that oddly seems to fit tonight's event. It's about an uprising taking place in Ireland. It's called The Rising of the Moon. So it oddly fits tonight's events. So here we go. Thank you. 
upon your shoulder at the rising of the moon. Out of many a mud wall cabin eyes were watching through the night. Many a man me heart was beating for the blessed morning light. Murmurs ran along the valley to the banshee's lonely gloom. And the thousand pikes were flushing at the rising of the moon. At the rising of the moon, at the rising of the moon. And the thousand pikes were flushing at the rising of the moon. All along that singing river, a black mass of men was seen. High above their shining weapons flew their own beloved green. Death to every foe and traitor, whistle out the marching tune. And the army boys for freedom Tis the rising of the moon Tis the rising of the moon Tis the rising of the moon And the army boys for freedom Tis the rising of the moon Tis the rising of the moon Tis the rising of the moon And the army boys for freedom Tis the rising of the moon All right, so we're basically waiting for Iran's response. We're waiting to see what what Iran does to Israel uh, in response to the brutal attack uh, that uh, that Israel carried out, and we're waiting to see uh, what the response of Israel to that attack is, and how the world responds to this. That's basically what we're waiting to see. Iran is going to retaliate, and at this point, um, we will see how Iran retaliates, and from there, we will know the situation, and we know this could very easily spin completely out of control. Um, we're just going to have to see. Um, so... Reports at this point are predicting a drone attack from Iran on Israel. Um, but there's also reports of a cruise missile attack on Israel. Um, so we're just going to have to see. But I figured that tonight would be a good time to talk about the fact that I spent a lot of time in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, so... I'm going to talk about Iran a little bit, because when I went to Iran in 2014, um, I learned that everything that Americans believe to be true about Iran is actually true of Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, I know that that's kind of ironic, but it's like, you know, we have in our minds that Iran is this this backward Islamic theocracy with sharia law and it's it's oh it's this backward country and it's full of armed groups and etc you know and that's what we think about iran and that's not true at all first of all the iranians are not arabs they're persians um you know the arab people speak the arabic language um they're a different ethnic group. The Iranians are not Arabs. Now, there are a lot of Iranians who speak Arabic because they are Muslims and because the Quran was written in Arabic. It's not considered to be a real Quran if it is in another language. The Quran must be in Arabic to be a Quran. And because the Islamic um, 
the Islamic government uh, very much pushes Islam and stuff. There are a lot of Iranians who speak the Arabic language, and there are some Arabs in Iran, not many. Um, but the Iranian language is Farsi, Persian, and the Iranian people are mostly Persians. Now, there are Kurds in Iran. There are Turkmen in Iran. Uh, there are some, a very small number of Arabs in Iran. There are Armenians in Iran. So not everyone in the country is Persian ethnically, but that is the majority of the people there. Um, and in Iran, they have elections and they elect their government. And in Iran, women can vote. And women serve in the military. They even have women that are brigadier generals in their military. Um, in Iran, uh, there are more women in, in college than men. Did you know this? In Iran, there are more women attending university than men. Um, and the reason for that is that in Iran, uh, college education is free. But you have to test, you know, get the test scores to get in. And so there are a lot of married women uh, who, after they've gotten married, uh, will pursue a university degree. So there are actually more women studying in universities than men. Um, Iran is not what you think it is. Um, Iran is an Islamic country that has had an Islamic revolution. Um, and I, I've talked about this before. Um, but, you know, generally since World War II, in the Middle East, um, you know, you've had two very large political trends. In the Middle East and in the Muslim world, you've had nationalism, Arab nationalism, and you've had, you've had Islamism. Um, and... You know, Arab nationalism uh, is secular in its nature, and it tends to be associated with the military of countries. And Islamism is highly religious, um, and it tends to be as associated with small business owners, um, you know. And it is the small business owners, the lower levels of capital, many of whom are not from the predominant ethnic group, but are deeply religious, they tend to be the basis of Islamism. And military leaders of Arab descent tend to be the basis of Arab nationalism. Now, Iran is not an Arab country, so this doesn't apply to Iran, but, but Arab nationalism, Ba'athist Arab socialism, the ideology of Abdul Nasser in Egypt, Gaddafi in Libya, um, the ideology of Saddam Hussein in Iraq and Bashar al-Assad in Syria, that movement began with what they called patriotic officers. And it would be people in the militaries of these countries who would overthrow, they would have a coup, they would overthrow the king. It was usually a monarch that was backed by the United States or the British Empire. Um, and he would be overthrown and the military would take power. And the military would align the country with the Soviet Union uh, and start to try and move toward a socialist economy. That's what happened in Egypt. That's what happened in Iraq. That's what happened in Syria. And in Egypt, you had the government of Abdel Nasser that was Arab socialism. He led a, the patriotic officers. They seized control of the Egyptian government. They aligned with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union built the largest power plant in the Middle East, the Ta uh, the um, the uh, Aswan Dam and electrified all of Egypt, and they were aligned with 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 Egypt and with the Soviet Union. Um, and in Egypt, there was a religious movement that started in the 1920s, um, and it was an anti-communist religious movement that was in awe of America. And that religious movement was called the Muslim Brotherhood. And it was led by an Islamic cleric who visited the United States in the 1920s. And he believed that America, the United States, despite not being a Muslim country, was more in line with Islam than the Middle East was. He argued that the Middle East was corrupt. The Middle East was backward. 
but he argued that that the Islamic the vision for Islam was enacted in America because in America we believed in capitalism. In America we we had morals and and moral legislation. Uh, and in America, all the different races and ethnic groups were together. There was no one ethnic group. And so the Muslim Brotherhood was formed as a religious movement in Egypt um, that said it's not about Arabs versus non-Arabs. It's about Islam. Everyone just needs to embrace Islam and do the right thing. And communism is our greatest enemy, of course, because communism is atheistic. It says that there is you know, no God, it's an atheistic movement. And communism seeks to build, you know, build a just society with the state and using the state to build a just society. Whereas in reality, we need people to just embrace Islam. We need people to embrace Islam, to pay a zakat or a tax to care for the poor, and that we don't need the state. Furthermore, uh, many of the people that were sympathetic to the Soviet Union and communism in Egypt were Arab nationalists. And they argued that it doesn't matter your religion. If you're an Arab Christian, if you're an Arab atheist or whatever, we're for the Arab people. And we should build unity on the basis of being Arabs. And many of the small business owners who made up the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood were not Arabs. They were of different nationalities, uh, but they were Muslims. Uh, so the Muslim Brotherhood was the main source of opposition to Arab socialism in Egypt. Um, and it was funded by the US CIA. The US CIA gave loads and loads of money to the Muslim Brotherhood to fight against Abdel Nasser and Arab socialism. And Islamism, as, as a political current, really flourished in the 1950s and 60s uh, as the opposition to communism among the Arab countries. Um, and today, um, Qatar, the Qatari monarchy, and the government of Turkey are both governments that are from this current, the Muslim Brotherhood current. Now, it's divided. There are different factions. But Erdogan, the president of Turkey, uh, he is an Islamist. He is a Muslim Brotherhood guy. Right. And when he was first elected, it was a very big deal because Turkey's constitution forbids the creation of an Islamic state. Turkey is founded on Turkish nationalism. Kemal Ataturk, the, the Turkish nationalist leader who led Turkey and established modern Turkey. Blessed be he who says I am a Turk. Kemal Ataturk forbid anyone uh, to discuss creating an Islamic state. It is against the Turkish constitution to advocate building an Islamic state. However, uh, there was a movement in Turkey to create an Islamist government, and it was led by a guy named Gulan, Fatullah Gulan. And Fatullah Gulan was a Muslim Brotherhood guy who was a CIA asset, most likely. Um, you know, I mean, and, you know, he was funded by the CIA and he actually owns test prep. Right. If you if you if you're if you have teenage kids who take, you know, test prep books for the SAT or the ACT, the company that prints them is most likely a company uh, that is owned by the uh, the Islamists, by the the government um, of, you know, of Fatala Gulan um, and Gulan built was based in Turkey. He was a Muslim Brotherhood preacher um, and he built the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey. And I know what I'm talking about at risk of being annoying. I know what I'm talking about because I will show you. I will show you a picture here and I will prove to you that I know uh, WTF I'm talking about. I'll put, show you that picture here in a second. But Fatullah Gulan built the Islamist movement in Turkey, which was heavily suppressed. Um, you know, I mean, it was illegal to advocate building an Islamic state in Turkey. Uh, they talked about how members of the religious movement of Gulan were arrested. Um, you know, um, there was a famous case um, where, um, you know, there were there was an Islamist activist in Turkey who was arrested. And what was he charged with? He was charged with um, with uh, with trying to conspire to build an Islamic state. And what was the evidence against him? The evidence against him was teacups. It was four teacups. And. At his trial, the prosecutor came out and he said, what is your evidence against him? And they said, well, 
He has four teacups that we found at his apartment, um, but there's only one guy who lives there. So these four teacups prove that in his apartment, he was having a conspiracy to create an Islamic state. Now, Gulen built this Islamist movement in Turkey. Um, and then the current president, Erdogan, got elected as the Islamist candidate. However, then Gulen started working against Erdogan because Erdogan moved in an anti-imperialist direction, and Fatala Gulen is a CIA asset. Um, so Fatala Gulen uh, had his falling out with Erdogan. Erdogan is the current president of Turkey who got elected, you know, as a result of Gulen's movement. Gulen, though, his movement is basically a CIA operation to try and mobilize Muslims to be anti-communist and to work for the United States. So where did Fatula Gulen move to? Where did he go after he had Erwan and Gulen had their falling out? Where did he go? Well, I know very well where Fatela Gulen went. He went to Pennsylvania. And that is me meeting with Fatela Gulen in Pennsylvania. Um, I have actually met Fatela Gulen, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood movement in Turkey, who had a falling out with Erwan, and he and his followers packed up and moved to Pennsylvania. And they have a huge compound in Pennsylvania uh, where they live. Now, during the, during the 2016 presidential election cycle in the United States, in 2016, uh, Fatela Gulen, a number of the people in the military that were loyal to him, tried to overthrow the Turkish president, Erdogan, and they failed. Um, and they tried to pull off a coup. So after the coup in 2016, Gulen had a press conference at his compound in Pennsylvania, and I actually got to visit the compound. So I've been, I have met Fatala Gulen, um, you know, and I got to tell you, this compound, you would, if you went there, you would have no idea it's the United States, right? I mean, it looks like you're in a Muslim country. Uh, you, all the buildings there have elevators in them. Uh, it's like a bunch of houses and you get in the elevator and the elevators play the Quran recitations as you go up and down in the elevator. And it's a whole compound, all these houses, and there's a pond with ducks and all of that. There's a bunch of Turkish uh, Turkish exiles who live in this compound uh, in Pennsylvania. They had a falling out with Erdogan. Um, and Fatullah Gulen's company, they own... Uh, the test prep, and they've made millions of dollars. Fatala Gulen is a billionaire, thanks to American intelligence that connected him with test prep. He owns the test prep companies. Uh, so again, if you ever buy, you know, the practice SAT test or the practice ACT test, um, you know, you're helping support this guy because that's where he gets his money from. Um, you know, and yes, that compound was built with U.S. tax dollars, right? But this is what the United States does. It builds counter gangs around the world. And Islamism, the Muslim Brotherhood, or what they call westernized Islam, is very much uh, a, a current of, you know, of U.S. intelligence. I mean, it's, it's U.S. aligned. However, that is not the only current in the Muslim world. Right, you have Westernized Islam, Fatela Gulen. Uh, when I went and visited Fatela Gulen's compound, uh, you know, we got to talk to a number of his followers. Um, you know, one of his followers joined the movement because when he was a teenager, he was studying computers, and he really loved computers. But you know, his local Muslim teachers all said that computers were sinful and violated Islam. But somebody gave him a magazine from Fatala Gulen, saying that Muslims should embrace technology and embrace computers, and that's how he followed him. And that, that Gulen has built this religious movement of what they call westernized Muslims. Um, and Erdogan comes out of that movement, but Erdogan, you know, has moved in a more anti-imperialist and nationalistic direction, and Gulen has fled to the United States. Gulen's followers tried to overthrow Erdogan in 2016 and failed, um, that's one wing of Muslim, Muslim religious politics, religious movements in the Middle East. Now, there's another wing of religious politics, religious movements in the Middle East that you should all be aware of. Uh, this is someone I don't have a picture with, thank God. Uh, but I'm sure you all know who this guy is. Let me put his image on the screen. Hold on. I'm sure you all know who, who this fellow is. Um, 
right? We all, anyone who's my age or, or older knows who this guy is because his face was on TV, you know, nonstop in 2001, uh, right? We all know who this guy is, right? Osama bin Laden. And what is Osama bin Laden's religious background? Osama bin Laden is not part of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? He does not think that the westernized way is the best way. He does not, he did not think that uh, that computers and the western way of doing things was the answer. Osama bin Laden is a Wahhabi, and Wahhabism is another religious current uh, that has been supported by U.S. imperialism in the Middle East to fight communism. Right. You know, they had the Muslim Brotherhood that they were backing the westernized Muslims to fight Arab nationalism in the 50s and 60s. And then in the 1980s, really in the late 70s and early 1980s, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia had a lot more money because of the OPEC boycott and the oil prices went up. And Saudi Arabia was aligned with the United States against the Soviet Union. And Saudi Arabia, um, you know, was, um, you know, and, um, Saudi Arabia is a U.S. aligned country that buys huge amounts of weapons. And and Osama bin Laden is the son of, you know, you know, Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy. No elections. You know, it's an absolute monarchy. Everything in the country is the property of the king. And in Saudi Arabia, there is a there is a company that has a state monopoly on construction. Right. It's the only construction company that legally exists in Saudi Arabia. And it's called Bin Laden Construction. It is the only company, um, you know, that that can do construction uh, in Saudi Arabia. Right. It's a state monopoly. If you build anything in Saudi Arabia, you have got to hire Bin Laden Construction to do it. Uh, so the family that owns Bin Laden Construction, uh, they're rolling in it. Bin Laden Construction Company, billion, billion, billion dollar company, right? Um, they've got a state monopoly in construction. Osama Bin Laden was from the Bin Laden family, from the construction family, one of the wealthiest families in Saudi Arabia. And he was a religious fanatic. And, you know, he, a rich kid from a very wealthy family, but he got into Wahhabism, right? Saudi Arabia is based on a different interpretation of Islam, not the westernized interpretation, but the interpretation of Islam called Wahhabism. And Wahhabism argues that the form of government that existed in the time of the Prophet Muhammad is the most pure, right? And that they want to go back to exactly as things were done in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Some people call them Salafis. Some people call them takfiris because they believe it is okay to kill other Muslims. Uh, and so they, they, they because they, they believe it's okay to kill other Muslims, uh, they are called takfiris. But they're Wahhabis, right? After the religious scholar who helped found Saudi Arabia, um, Wahhab, right? They're called Wahhabis. Some of them only eat with three fingers. When they eat, they eat only with three fingers uh, because the Prophet Muhammad according to some reports, only ate with three fingers, so they only eat with three fingers. And because in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the government was a monarchy, the caliphate, they think the Saudi Arabia government, that's an absolute monarchy, um, they think that that is the best form of government. Um, and, you know, they don't like women, women driving cars. Uh, they don't like women riding bicycles. They don't like women um, being outside of the home. Uh, they believe in very, 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 very liberal use of the death penalty. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world that still executes people by means of beheading. Often the beheadings are carried out in public. They cut people's heads off publicly. Um, you know, it's a very, very uh, authoritarian, backward country. Uh, it's very much in the Middle Ages, but they've got lots and lots of oil, uh, lots and lots of oil. Um, and so, you know, the, the Saudi royal family are very, very wealthy. Um, Wahhabism is the religious brand of Islam promoted by Saudi Arabia, um, being exactly true to how the prophet lived. And in the late seventies, the United States government started using Wahhabism to fight the Soviet Union. And in Afghanistan, you had the People's Democratic Party, uh, the communist 
party taking power, the communist aligned party taking power. It was called the Sour Revolution of 1978. Um, and so with the People's Demo Democratic Party in power in Afghanistan, the United States government started mobilizing and they teamed up with this guy, this guy that, that you know, we all know about. They found this guy, Osama bin Laden, and he started rallying the Muslims of the world to go and fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan um, and build a Wahhabi army, uh, according to the Wahhabi teaching of Islam. Um, and Wahhabis, people that converted to the strict, uh, you know, the strict Islamist in, in, interpretation that you got to do everything exactly as the prophet did. You got to have an absolute monarchy. You, you know, you eat with three fingers and all of that, um, that um, they started rallying around this guy who got weapons and support, et cetera, um, you know, from the U.S. government to fight the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And because Saudi Arabia had a lot more money because of the oil uh, boom uh, and because of the fact that Saudi Arabia, you know, they are a primary purchaser of U.S. weapons, Wahhabi groups started growing in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, and these Wahhabi groups, they were radical Muslims. You could call them Islamists, uh, but they're very different than the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood loves America and wants the Middle East to be just like America and thinks that America is more Muslim than the Muslim world. These guys, on the other hand, the Wahhabis, think that America is a sinful, decadent, evil society um, and that they want to go back to the, the way of, of the Prophet Muhammad. They want to have an absolute monarchy. They want women not to drive cars. They want to not have elected governments. They want to, you know, they're they're polar opposites, but they're both supported by the United States. The United States supported, you know, Gulan and his movement to fight against communism. Then later they supported Osama bin Laden and the Wahhabi movement to fight against communism. Um, and those, those are the two currents. And then of course you had Arab nationalism and Arab nationalism is secular, right? And that Arab nationalism, which took power in Egypt with Abdel Nasser, which took power in in Iraq with Saddam Hussein, which took power in Syria with Hafez Assad and Bashar al-Assad, Arab nationalism doesn't advocate an Islamic government. It advocates a secular government. Okay? Those are basically the political currents in the Middle East, except for this other current that I'm about to tell you about. This other current which is at this point, this is the main form of anti-imperialism in the Middle East. And, you know, you can criticize it all you want and you can say that it's it's wrong in many, many ways. And I, I, I'm not even going to bother arguing with you about that because it doesn't really matter what you think. And it doesn't even really matter what I think. Some things are true and some things are not. And at this point, no one can deny that the main anti-imperialist force in the Middle East, the main people in the Middle East that are fighting against Israel, that are fighting against capitalism, fighting against imperialism, that are aligned with the Soviet, with, with China, with Russia, with, with Cuba and Venezuela, all of those forces are from yet another political current. And in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, the main political current that was fighting U.S. imperialism in the Middle East was Baathism, uh, Baathist Arab socialism, Arab nationalism. However, nowadays, the main anti-imperialist current in the Middle East, whether you want to admit this or not, whether this bothers you, you can deny it, you can pretend it's not true, but the main current of anti-imperialism, the people that are on the front lines battling the imperialists every day, fighting for the Palestinians, you know, fighting for the oppressed, aligning themselves with Venezuela, aligning themselves with Cuba, aligning themselves with Russia and China and North Korea. It's the political current that was started by this guy. That is Ayatollah Khomeini, Rohala Khomeini. Khomeini. Khomeini was the founder of the Islamic Revolution of Iran. And Khomeini has a very, very interesting 
religious background. Khomeini was a very prominent Muslim cleric. He was a Shia Muslim cleric in Iran. And he was a conservative, a very, very conservative cleric. And Iran was ruled by the Shah, who was a dictator. So let's let's back up, right? Iran had a, a, a king, a monarch called the Shah, right? It was the Pahlavi family. And they ruled Iran. And when World War II started, they liked Hitler uh, because they said that Iranians are are a, uh, Aryans. They're Persian. Persians are Aryans. They're part of Hitler's master race. And the Pahlavi dynasty, the royal family of Iran, they liked them some Hitler. They didn't like communists and they didn't like the Soviet Union, but they also didn't like the British and they didn't like the United States. And so that left a third option for them. And the Pahlavi dynasty, they liked Hitler. So World War II happened and the Soviet Union and the British said, we can't have a pro-Hitler government right in the middle of Europe during World War II. So the British Empire and the Soviet Union invaded Iran together and toppled the Shah during World War II. And the Shah was overthrown during World War II. And after World War II, Iran had a democratic constitution. And that democratic constitution, uh, it was, you know, modeled on the U.S. Constitution, the British Constitution, but the Soviet Union was helpful in writing it too. And there was a large communist party in Iran called the Tuda Party. Um, in Iran, after World War II, they had a government. Um, and the government that came into power, they elected a leader named Mohammad Mossadegh. Mohammad Mossadegh. And Mohammad Mossadegh was the president of Iran who was elected democratically. And Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, he was not a communist in any conceivable way. Mohammad Mossadegh, he was not a communist, but the Communist Party was a big party in Iran, or the Tudeh Party. Um, you know, it was a very big, major political party in Iran. And he had a relationship with them, and the Soviet Union was there in the region. And he wasn't totally in the U.S. camp, right? He wasn't completely a puppet of the United States, this guy, right? He wasn't a communist, but sometimes he went with the United States and other times he went with the Soviet Union and he allowed the Communist Party, the Tudeh Party, to legally exist, right? He said that they they're should be part of the government. They should be allowed to exist. Um, well, CIA was not having any of that. CIA could not stand the fact that this guy had a democratic government in Iran um, that the CIA couldn't couldn't handle that. Uh, so in 1953, uh, the the military of Iran they found a lot of people in the Iranian military who really liked the Shah and the Pahlavi monarchy, and they had a coup, and they overthrew the government the elected president, Mohammad Mossadegh, and they installed the Shah of Iran. And the Shah of Iran was the was the religious dictator of Iran uh, from 1953 until the Islamic Revolution of 1979. And, uh, you know, the, the Pahlavi family, the dynasty that the British and the Americans had overthrown during World War II was brought back because they were anti-communist, because they were against the Soviet Union. Because and they outlawed the Communist Party, the Tudor Party was forced to operate underground, um, and they they were a brutal authoritarian regime. And the Shah of Iran had a secret police force called Savak. That's what they were called, and they were known to torture people very horrifically, you know, in horrible, awful ways. Almost every member of of Iran, every Iranian family has a family member who was killed or tortured or arrested by Savak. They often just arrested, arrested random people just to terrify people. People would just disappear in Iran, right? That during the Shah's time, just to keep the population afraid, random people would get disappeared and tortured. And maybe they'd be released afterwards and maybe they wouldn't, right? It was just utterly horrific. But the CIA was working closely with Savak, helping Savak torture people. And it was pretty bad. Uh, the Pahlavi dynasty, uh, the Shah of Iran, he was very, very, very ruthless. Um, and he was very, very secular, right? Um, you know, a lot of the people in his inner circle were Baha'is, uh, which is a religious minority. 
Uh, and the Shah was pretty secular. He was a secular nationalistic leader, I guess, but he was basically a puppet of the United States. And he was ruthless and he tortured people and he hated communists and he made sure that the Communist Party was completely underground and illegal and, and et cetera. But 1970, uh, but anyway, let me, before, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, however, the Shah, you know, in, in Iran, he was torturing people. He was hurting people. A lot of people in Iran didn't like the Shah. And there was fear upon the part of the United States that there would be a revolution against the Shah, right? And so the Kennedy administration basically forced the Shah to enact all kinds of liberal reforms. So in the early 60s, I think 1963, the Kennedy administration forced the Shah to announce that he was having a white revolution. And it was the Shah suddenly started talking like he was a socialist and he redistributed land to poor people and he you know, gave women the right to vote and he enacted certain rights for women in the Constitution. And it was all he was still a brutal dictator. He was still a puppet of the United States. But basically, the Kennedy administration was afraid that if the Shah didn't you know, start making people's lives a little bit better, he didn't you know, he created a state run airline, a government run airline company. And he redistributed some land to the poor people in the countryside and he gave women some rights. And he did a lot of things that made it look like he was he was modernizing the country. Well, when he did that, there was a religious leader, a cleric who didn't agree with what he was doing. And that cleric was Khomeini. And Khomeini is a conservative Muslim. Muslim leader and Khomeini. He said that, that the Shah was in love with the West and the Shah was moving away from Islam and the Shah was moving away from the Islamic way. And a lot of what Khomeini said doesn't exactly match the way things are now. Like Khomeini didn't want women to have the right to vote, from what I understand. He changed his mind on that later, but, you know, he didn't like, uh, you know, you know, the Shah, you know, was too, was, was carrying out these liberal Western reforms uh, that were that were done at the behest of the United States, and Khomeini did not like it. So Khomeini, because he was this very very prominent Shia religious leader, uh, he was forced to flee the country, and um, he fled the country and he lived in exile. And from exile, I believe he was in France. From France and I think Britain, uh, Khomeini. Um, you know, who was, um, you know, uh, he was in exile. He maintained a huge following. And in Iran, there were underground radio stations that would broadcast his sermons. And he did audio recordings. He would record his sermons from Europe and they would smuggle the tapes back into Iran and they would play them over the radio. And many people in the Iranian government, many military leaders, etc., uh, they really loved to listen to Khomeini uh, because he represented, he he did not like the Shah's Western liberal reforms. And so from, you know, from the early 60s, so on, Khomeini was in exile. Now, the world started changing in the 1960s, right? In the 1960s, the Vietnam War happened, obviously, um, and the USA got defeated in Vietnam. And people all over the world were supporting Vietnam and its struggle against U.S. imperialism. Um, well, Khomeini, despite the fact that he wasn't a communist, he supported the Vietnamese people in their fight against U.S. imperialism. In Ireland, the Irish Republican Army was fighting against the British Empire. Well, Khomeini, even though he wasn't a communist, he supported the Irish and the Irish Republican Army. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. started marching for civil rights and Malcolm X was a leader of the Black Liberation Movement and Khomeini supported Malcolm X and supported uh, the Black Liberation Movement in America. And Khomeini's ideology shifted during the late 1960s, right? He was still a Muslim through and through, still a very, very conservative Muslim cleric, but he was against capitalism. And he was against imperialism. Um, and his sermons emphasized opposition to capitalism and imperialism and support for people around the world that were struggling against capitalism and imperialism. 
And he talked about black people and their fight for freedom in America. He talked about the Black Panthers. He talked about Ho Chi Minh and the struggle of the Vietnamese people. He talked about the Irish people and their struggle for freedom. He talked about the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And that he his ideology shifted to emphasize anti-imperialism. Um, however, Khomeini was not a communist. And Khomeini began arguing uh, that, that the focus should be on neither East nor West. That was the slogan he used, neither East nor West. And he warned about the danger of nuclear weapons. He said that if, if nuclear weapons, nuclear war was evil, nuclear weapons were evil, and that, that the, the East and the West, the Soviet Union and the United States uh, were threatening the world with nuclear war and that Iran wanted neither of those things. And what they wanted was not capitalism, but Islam. And that was the slogan he used, not capitalism, but Islam, right? Neither East nor West, not capitalism, but Islam and war of poverty against wealth, war of poverty against wealth. Uh, those were the three slogans that he used. And he built this movement um, that, um, you know, um, that, that was against imperialism, against capitalism, very religious, but also against communism because communism was atheistic, because communism was aligning with the East and with the Soviet Union and communist countries had nuclear weapons and he was against nu nuclear weapons. So he was for neither East nor West. And he would refer, he referred to America as the great Satan or Shaitan i Bazorg, uh, the great Satan. And he said that Israel was the little Satan, which meant that Israel worked for the great Satan, right? Israel was the little Satan deployed by America to attack the people of the Middle East. And he condemned American economic and military imperialism, but he also condemned what he called Soviet social imperialism which that's the same word that the Chinese used, but he meant it differently. He said that the Americans, they militarily attack countries and they economically exploit countries, but the Soviet Union, they force their culture onto countries. They force countries to move away from Islam. They force their secular way onto things. So we reject Soviet social imperialism and we reject American military and economic imperialism, neither East nor West, war of poverty against wealth, not capitalism, but Islam. And he had this big movement of followers. Um, and we all know what happened. Um, you know, there were, there, were, there were protests against the Shah, um, and those protests against the Shah were brutally suppressed, and a lot of innocent people got killed. Um, and it was a very brutal massacre of protesters that happened. And so the, the Shah of Iran declared a national holiday of mourning and tried to calm the public down in response to the protests. And that inspired many, many more people to protest. And Khomeini got on the radio and his sermons were broadcast on the radio. And he said that now is the time to go out and risk your life. And so Iranians put on funeral, you know, burial gowns, the kind of gowns that you would be buried alive in. And they went out into the streets to protest, knowing that they would get killed. And thousands and thousands of Iranians poured out into the streets to oppose the Shah of Iran. And the Shah stepped down and Khomeini returned to Iran and the military aligned with Khomeini and the Islamic Republic of Iran was declared. Um, and a government led by Khomeini uh, was created. And the Islamic constitution of Iran named Khomeini as the supreme leader, meaning that he was the religious leader of the country, but he was not the political leader. The political leader was the elected president. Uh, however, the Islamic, the Islamic constitution and democracy had to be guided by religious leaders. They have this thing called the Guardian Council that vets every candidate to make sure that the candidate is in line with the Islamic teaching. Uh, there are different political parties, et cetera, but they are, they follow the Supreme leader and the Khomeini, his teachings and his ideology is the basis for the government and his guardian council approves or disapproves the candidates, but they do have elections, et cetera. 
and they created the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and all over the world, uh, especially in the Middle East region, Shia Muslims went crazy because they believed that, I shouldn't say they went crazy, but they they got very, very excited because they believed that this was, you know, this was the end times. Um, and Khomeini began calling himself Imam Khomeini, which many people thought was a hint that he was the Mekdi, uh, that he was the, you know, the, the, the final Imam, the last Imam to bring in the end times. Um, and so all over the Middle East, um, all over the Middle East, um, you know, Shia Muslims went out and rebelled. And in Saudi Arabia, uh, they seized Mecca. And the Shia Muslims of Saudi Arabia seized the holy city of Mecca. And there was a big battle uh, for control of Mecca between the, the Shia Muslim revolutionaries inspired by Khomeini, who seized the city, and the Saudi government. It ended with a very brutal massacre, a lot of beheadings. Uh, in Pakistan, there were uprisings by the Shia. In Lebanon, there were uprisings by the Shia. All over the Middle East, Shia Muslims rebelled because they thought the end times were coming. Um, they thought that this was going to be the end of the world. They thought that he was the Mekdi, um, etc. Now, also inside of Iran, it it wasn't clear, right? So Iran had just toppled the Shah, the U.S.-backed dictator. Khomeini and his government had just set up shop. But there were a lot of people, were, they were not the only faction in Iran, okay? So you had, um, you know, um, you had the, the government of, of, of Khomeini, um, but then you also had a number of communist groups in Iran uh, that existed, right? And they all, you know, they had all been trying to overthrow the Shah, but now they had to figure out wh what they were going to do about Khomeini because Khomeini was the new government. Um, and so, you know, you had the Tudeh party, which was the communist party, the Soviet aligned communist party. Um, and they ran the labor unions in the cities um, and they were supporting the Soviet union. Um, and they supported Khomeini because they said, Hey, this guy's an anti-imperialist. Uh, this guy is a, you know, he came to power and they, they supported Khomeini. They even formed a, um, uh, an activist group. I think it was called students who take the imam's line. They supported Khomeini because they're like, Hey, he's anti-imperialist. You know, he's not pro-Soviet like we are, but we'll support him, you know, and hope that he becomes more friendly to the Soviet union. Then you had another group called the people's Fedayeen guerrillas. And they went to the countryside and tried to launch guerrilla warfare. Uh, they were Maoists. Uh, they were inspired by Che Guevara. They were, you know, more radical than the Communist Party. And they thought that Iran needed to have rural people's war. They needed to go in the countryside. And so they were trying to form some kind of armed revolution in the countryside. Um, um, and then you had, there was another group that was called Mujahideen Kalk, M-E-K, uh, which means the People's Holy Warriors. And they were Islamic communists, they called themselves, uh, Mujahideen Kalk. But they weren't really Muslims because Muslims believe that, that the prophet Muhammad is the last prophet on earth. However, these folks, they worshipped their leader, Mas Masood Rajavi. And Masood Rajavi, this is their leader, Masood Rajavi, um, he said that he was a prophet. And so if you believed in Masood Rajavi, you can't be a Muslim because Muslims say there's no prophets after the prophet Muhammad. Well, they believed that that this their guy, this guy, Masood Rajavi, they thought that he was a prophet and that, that he was the combined reincarnation of Lenin and Jesus and the prophet Muhammad in one body and that he was going to usher in a global communist and Muslim revolution uh, and that that he was he was the Mekdi. He was the, the, the end times. He was, he was leading that. And so the Mujahideen Kalk was this weird Islamic, I guess they called themselves Islamo Marxist cult. They weren't Muslims. They were, I don't know what you want to call them. They were a strange religious sect that was pro-communist that worshiped this guy, um, you know, and uh, they worshiped this dude um, and they existed. Um, and at first they supported Khomeini. Uh, because Khomeini was anti-imperialist and Khomeini had appointed a cleric who was friendly to them, who, who, you know, talked to them and, and would invite them to his office to talk to him. So they, at first they liked Khomeini, but then Khomeini 
fired that cleric. And Khomeini announced there would be no, you know, Islamo-Marxists in his government. Khomeini said, we cannot allow anyone who wants to combine Islam with Marxism in our government, right? Marxism is completely opposed to everything the Islamic Republic stands for. So, so Khomeini got rid, he purged the government of all pro-Marxist or pro-communist clerics. Um, so because of that, um, because of that, the Mujahideen cult decided to go on a killing spree. Um, and they killed all kinds of people. And they bombed the Iranian parliament and killed 81 members of parliament. Can you imagine this? That would be like, you know, like the U.S. Congress being bombed and 81 members of Congress being killed. I mean, it's insane, right? We get mad because, you know, some conservative, you know, right wing guys ran around and, you know, you know, farted in Nancy Pelosi's desk or whatever. I mean, it's like, you know, this they, they blew up the parliament and killed 81 members of the parliament. They they bombed and killed all kinds of innocent people. And Mujahideen Kalk was this very violent group. And everything they did, they did in the name of communism. Also, um, Iraq, which is Iran's neighbor, was led by, um, you know, Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein was an Arab nationalist, and Iraq has Shia Muslim leaders, um, and has many Shia Muslims. The majority of Muslims in Iraq are Shia Muslims. So there were many Shia Muslims in Iraq uh, who were inspired by Khomeini, and Saddam Hussein feared that Iran might try to inspire an Islamic uprising against him. So Saddam Hussein invaded Iran, and Iran uh, was invaded by Iraq, and Iraq was very friendly with the Soviet Union. It was an Arab nationalist government. So Iraq invaded Iran. And so I Iran is fighting off an Iraqi invasion, plus they've got this crazy, you know, Mujahideen Kalk group that claimed they were communists or whatever, um, you know, and so in that atmosphere, there was a very, very big crackdown on communists in Iran. It was basically illegal to be a communist because communists were considered to be aligned with Iraq. It was invading. The Mujahideen cult communist group had blown up the parliament and killed all kinds of people. And so the communist parties were basically forced to dissolve. Um, and at that point, many communists fled from Iran because it was illegal to be a communist. And many were tortured, many were executed, many were arrested. What's interesting is the, the Soviet-aligned party, the Tude party, they formally dissolved as a party, and then they, they, um, they formed like a religious party that would like carry out the function of, um, of, the, of the, the Communist Party. Um, I think it was like the Labor Party, something like that. But then they went to the Khomeini government and volunteered to help go after the Mujahideen Kalk and go after the, uh, the Fedayeen. Um, and so the Tude party, um, in order to try and gain credibility with uh, Khomeini, they helped crack down on the other communist groups. Um, now, they did this um, because they saw the other communist groups as being dangerous ultra-leftist radicals. Um, and they also, they did believe that because Khomeini had come to power in an anti-imperialist revolution, Khomeini, you know, was better than what was there before and they wanted to support him and they wanted to nudge Khomeini to be more anti-imperialist. Um, so because of that, um, the Tudeh party kind of functioned as allies of Khomeini, even though they were illegal, um, which is very interesting, right? They were technically not a legal party but they aligned with Khomeini against the rest of the, the, the left. Um, and the, you know, they, they sent their members would pretend to join the Mujahideen Akalk and get information and give it to the, the police of the Islamic Republic. And they did these things. And it actually, there's a logic to it because Khomeini was an anti-imperialist. He was the leader of the Islamic Republic. Um, you know, and, you know, and these other groups, the Mujahideen Kalk were nut job, crazy, ultra left, extremist, violent terrorists. And the Fedayeen, you know, they were also doing crazy things. And so there's actually, I think it actually made sense that Tudo would want to show that they were good allies of Khomeini and as a way to kind of gain favor with Khomeini, help Khomeini crack down on the left of the rest of the communist groups. And what's interesting is many communists around the world hate the Tudeh party for this. And they say the Tudeh party are traitors and collaborators. But I actually think there's, it makes perfect sense what they were doing. Um, and I mean, MEK, Mujahideen Kalk, has ended up being a 
pro-Zionist organization that has murdered Iranian scientists and works for Israel at this point. Um, you know, uh, and all the other groups have just kind of faded into nothing. So, I mean, there's a logic to what they were doing. But regardless, so when Iraq invaded Iran, <laughs> Iran had to mobilize the whole country to defeat the Iraqi invaders. Um, and so they had the Iraq-Iran war. Um, and the Iraq-Iran war, um, this was a very ugly war. And uh, during this war, Khomeini had to mobilize the country to defeat the invaders. So Khomeini, even though he preached against communism, Iran became much more socialist during the Iraq-Iran war. And for example, he had to form these things called Basij councils, right? And you can read about them. Um, and I, I've been to Iran and I've, I've been to Basij councils and spoken to meetings of the Basij councils, right? Uh, he formed this group called Basij and every community and every neighborhood in Iran has a Basij. And it means the mobilized oppressed. The mobilized oppressed is what they're called. Um, the mobilized oppressed, um, you know, or the, the resistance mobilization force or the organization of the oppressed. There's different translations. But every neighborhood has it. And it's basically, it's, it's a community assembly. It's like the Bolivarian circles in Venezuela. It's like the committees to defend the revolution in Cuba. It's these these councils that enforce the goals of the Re Islamic revolution. The other thing is he launched what was called a construction jihad, where Iran built thousands of hospitals, thousands of power plants, thousands of steel mills. I mean, it was, it was a mobilization. And you imagine this, the country's in the middle of a war being invaded by a foreign country. And at the same time, they're rapidly industrializing. It, was, it would be like if Stalin had launched the five-year plans during World War II. So in the 80s, Iran was like going into overdrive and the whole population was going out and building and constructing and all the young men were going out and fighting the invaders. And what Iran achieved under those circumstances was nothing short of a miracle, right? I mean, it was utterly, the fact that Iran you know, came out of the Iraq-Iran war. I mean, chemical weapons were used against them. Um, you know, uh, the United States was against them. The Soviet Union was kind of helping Saddam Hussein, was kind of against them. I mean, I think the Soviet Union basically wanted the war to end. They were constantly trying to end it. But Saddam Hussein was more their ally than Khomeini was. So they were more or less on, on Saddam's side, even though they didn't really want to be. Um, you know, um, and under those circumstances, I don't know how Iran pulled it off, but they defeated the Iraqi invaders. Uh, they built the country up. They industrialized and constructed and they industrialized very rapidly and they electrified the whole country. And I mean, Khomeini got some shit done. Right. And they said it was neither capitalism or socialism. It was the Islamic system, not capitalism, but Islam. Right. That's what they called it. Not capitalism, but Islam. Um, and, uh, they were, you know, um, they were all about it. Um, they were, they were building a revolutionary movement, um, and they, they defeated the invaders, um, you know, and that's where the Islamic Republic of Iran comes from. Now, after the Iraq-Iran war, Iran moved in a much more conservative direction because the Soviet Union was falling. The Soviet Union was falling. Um, and, you know, politics were changing and Iran was never a Soviet aligned country. There's a very famous story of a Soviet diplomat went and, uh, met with Khomeini, um, and was not respectful. So Khomeini got up and walked out and, you know, also when the Soviet Union was falling, Khomeini wrote a letter to Gorbachev and he said, if you want to save the Soviet Union, you have to convert the Soviet Union to Islam. And it was a very famous letter. And he said that only Islam could save the Soviet Union. Uh, there's nothing wrong with socialism, he said, but you need God and you can't be secular and you need to embrace God um, and you need to, to follow the Quran. Um, and, you know, Khomeini died. Um, his, his funeral was, you know, it was like thousands and thousands of people gathered. And I mean, and, and it was it was wild. But anyway, um, Khomeini died. Um, in the 90s, Iran, you know, Iraq was their main enemy and Iraq, uh, you know, uh, you know, the U.S. fought Iraq in the Gulf War and Iraq was their main enemy. 
And Iran looked like it was drifting into a more pro-U.S. direction. Um, you know, uh, however, um, what happened? 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, um, you'll remember how after 9-11, George W. Bush, um, he said that, that he was going to go after the axis of evil. And he named three countries as the axis of evil. Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Three countries that had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. Right, Iraq was Baathist Arab socialism, Saddam Hussein. Iran was the Islamic Republic, Shia Islam, and North Korea is a Marxist-Leninist communist government. But he called them the the axis of evil. And then the USA invaded Iraq, um, and chaos ensued, and there was chaos on Iran's border with Iraq. So Iran elected a president, Ahmadinejad, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, um, who became the the president of, of Iran. And the presidency of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was a turning point in Iranian history. And I am actually going to show you guys, I have never showed this picture on here before, right? I, but at this point, I don't think there's any reason not to show it, um, you know? So what the heck, you know? I showed you earlier my picture with Gulan. I might as well show you all this picture. Um, so hold on, um, hold on. I'm gonna show you all. I'm gonna show you all a picture. Um, so I just have to hold on. I'm just gonna put a picture here on the screen. Um, all right. Just let me let me put this picture on the screen. But the the presidency of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad it was a really big turning point in Iranian history. Because Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, um, you know, when he when he became president of Iran, he did it in response to the fact that that you had had, um, you know, you'd had the uh, the presidency, you'd had the United States declaring Iran to be the axis of evil, um, and uh, you know, the USA had declared Iran to be the axis of evil. Um, and then you also had in Venezuela, you had Hugo Chavez, who'd gotten elected um, as the as the president, who was moving Venezuela in a socialist direction. So Mahmoud Ahmadinejad became the president of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I happen to know a thing or two about Mahmoud Ahmadinejad because I've met him. Um, and that's me with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. That's me. There's standing next to me as Imam Sultan, the leader of the uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, the main Nation of Islam mosque in Chicago. And I am standing there with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, right? So I have actually met the former president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, I met him in Tehran. And Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the first president that had ever been elected in Iran who was not a cleric. Right? He was not from a religious background. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was an engineer uh, by trade. His background was as a, an engineer uh, rather than as a, a religious scholar. And he had no beard uh, at the time that he was elected. Even now, he's, he's got a little bit of a, you know, he doesn't have a full beard. Um, and when he got elected, many of the communists uh, who were in exile, who had fled the country, were told that they could come home, which is very interesting. Um, and he actually set up a nonprofit in Iran or a building called the House of Latin America that managed Iran's relationship with Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua and the other socialist anti-imperialist countries of Latin America. And Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, his speeches condemned capitalism. Um, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was seen as kind of the Iranian Hugo Chavez. Um, and, you know, the oil prices had very significantly risen because of Bush. Um, and, you know, the oil prices were through the roof. So the Iranian state had a lot more oil than it had had, you know, oil money than, than it had had before. And so Ahmadinejad, um, Ahmadinejad, uh, he, he was elected and he, you know, started enacting, you know, socialistic programs for the, the working class and for poorer people. He he expanded the the socialistic nature of Iran's economy. 
he was a popular anti-imperialist leader. Um, and, you know, he, he moved Iran in a very anti-imperialist direction to be close with Cuba, to be close with Venezuela, et cetera. Um, hey, hey, man, not a secret, not a secret. Um, but anyhow, so um, that was Ahmadinejad. So, so Ahmadinejad, um, you know, he, he condemned the United States. He condemned capitalism, very anti-imperialist, very, very anti-capitalist, et cetera. Um, so the USA put all kinds of sanctions on Iran, and the USA said that Iran was trying to develop nuclear weapons, which they were not trying to do. Iran has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, so there is no way that, I mean, every site, every nuclear power site in Iran is monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency. There's no way they could be developing nuclear weapons, but Israel started playing up the idea that Iran was developing nuclear weapons. Oh my God, Iran is developing nuclear weapons. They're going to get nukes. They're going to kill us all. It was all a lie. Um, so in response to, after that, um, you know, Ahmadinejad, he had a fight with the supreme leader, the current supreme leader of Iran, Khamenei, right? Now the current supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, who replaced Khomeini after Khomeini died, he's an interesting guy because he was a communist before the Islamic Revolution. Right. He got his degree in Moscow um, and he lived in Russia for many years. And he was a communist until, you know, until the 70s when he converted to being a Muslim, back to being a Muslim at the time of the Islamic Revolution. Um, he realized based on, you know, he, he joined Khomeini's movement and he rejected communism and Marxism. But his background, his political training, his his background is in communism which many people do not realize that he spent, you know, he studied communism at a Soviet university. That's where he got his PhD. I believe he's a PhD in political science and he got it from a communist university in the Soviet Union. And he was a communist, but then in the mid seventies, he converted to being a Muslim um, and he rejected communism um, and he was imprisoned in Iran, um, you know, and, you know, he, you know, he's a very, very, very well-educated man. Um, you know, and, you know, he's the supreme leader of Iran, right? Ahmadinejad was president, but Ahmadinejad and the supreme leader were fighting with each other. And Ahmadinejad dissed the supreme leader of Iran. I forget how, there's something he did where he was disrespecting the supreme leader. So they basically told Ahmadinejad, you can't run for president again. He was not allowed to run for president again. So Iran had an election and they elected this guy. And this guy is... Rouhani, Hassan Rouhani. And Hassan Rouhani, I'll, I'll put him on the screen. Hassan Rouhani. Um, Hassan Rouhani, he said that Ahmadinejad is a radical. Ahmadinejad is an extremist. Ahmadinejad is so radical and extreme. He has alienated Iran from the rest of the world. I'm going to get into office and I am going to negotiate with America. That's what he said. He was a reformist, right? And he, there, there are, at this point in Iran, there are two factions. There are the hardliners, and they call themselves the principalists, and that's Ahmadinejad and the current president, Riazi. And they call themselves principalists. The people who don't like them call them hardliners. And then there are the reformists, and the, the reformists call themselves reformists, uh, and the people who don't like them call them the moderates. Now, the supreme leader of Iran says that every Muslim should be both a reformist and a principalist, right? And that there's elements of Islam that require you to be a reformist, and there's elements of Islam that require you to be a principalist, and that you have to balance both of them. Uh, so the, the, these are the two wings of Iranian politics. Now, there's many different political parties but the two sides, the Democrats and the Republicans of Iran, are the, the reformists and the hardliners, or the, the principalists and the moderates. Um, you know, and those are the two sides. Rouhani was from the reformist or the moderate side. And he said that Ahmadinejad was so radical and so extreme uh, that he alienated the world. And so he was going to get in and he was going to make a nuclear deal with the United States. And he would negotiate with Barack Obama and they would make a nuclear deal. And that nuclear deal would lead to um, would lead to a de-escalation uh, 
with the United States and it would make the Iranian economy better. So good for him, right? I mean, that was what he said. So he said, I'm going to get elected and I'm going to make a deal with America and America will treat us better. And there you go. And he came to the United Nations after he was elected and he gave a speech where he called for forming a wave, a world against violence and extremism. And he called for everyone in the world to join the wave. And he was just, you know, sugar and spice and everything nice. And we're not extreme and we're not radical. Um, and what I thought was just annoying when he came to the United Nations, I was there the first time I was reporting on it for press TV. And at every press conference he gave, they would ask him if the Holocaust happened. And he would say, yes, the Holocaust happened, but it doesn't justify Israel's crimes. And I swear they asked him that question like a hundred times when he was at the United Nations. Why? Because they wanted him to fuck up. They wanted him to say it slightly wrong at some point so they could say that he said it didn't happen. Right. The Zionists were determined they don't want peace with Iran. So every press conference he gave, they'd say, oh, did the Holocaust happen? And he would say, the Holocaust happened, but it doesn't justify what Israel does over and over and over again, because they were hoping that just that one time he would slip and say something slightly wrong and they could announce that he was a Holocaust denier. Unbelievable. Just utterly unbelievable. And I watched this and I'm just like, are you kidding me? So, so then we know what happened that under with Rouhani as president, um, with Rouhani as president, um, uh, they sent this guy, Javid Zarif, they sent Javid Zarif to, to Geneva, Switzerland, to negotiate with John Kerry to make the Iran nuclear deal. And for months, they had what were called the P5 plus one talks, where the top five economies in the world negotiated with Iran. Right. And it was the P5 plus one talks. They were figuring out the terms of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and the foreign minister of Iran who worked for Rouhani was Javid Zarif. Um, and, you know, again, at risk of, you know, I, I can't can't help myself, folks. I just have to show you uh, that I've been places and I've done stuff. Um, this this guy, Javid Zarif. Javid Zarif, that's me with Javid Zarif at the United Nations. Um, Javid Zarif negotiated with John Kerry in Geneva to negotiate the Iran nuclear conclusion. Um, and it took them quite a long time. But ultimately, they finally did reach an agreement. And basically what happened was in exchange for Iran dismantling almost all of its nuclear power plants. Almost all of Iran's nuclear power plants were dismantled in exchange for the USA acknowledging in writing that Iran has the right to develop nuclear power. Um, you know, and that Iran has the right to peaceful nuclear energy and the USA lifting a bunch of sanctions on Iran. And Iran was allowed into the SWIFT system. They were allowed to have bank transfers on the SWIFT system. Uh, and a lot of sanctions were lifted, and the USA acknowledged on paper that Iran had the right to um, to have peaceful nuclear energy. So that happened under Ahmadinejad, or under under Rouhani, and under Javid Zarif. So Iran, uh, they they had they had the Iran nuclear deal, and so the promise of Rouhani was that that would make the economy of Iran better. Um, and for a little bit, there was a little bit of an improvement because suddenly they could do bank transfers on SWIFT and suddenly, um, suddenly they could, uh, you know, they could, they could, you know, make, you know, they, they could, you know, they had the right to nuclear power, et cetera. But almost immediately, the U.S. Congress put more sanctions onto Iran. And uh, also, um, this is this is worth pointing out. While the Iran nuclear deal was being signed, and while Congress was ratifying it, uh, the Israeli president um, came Netanyahu came to the U.S. Congress, 
and gave a speech against the Iran nuclear deal. I don't know if you remember this, but um, Netanyahu was so opposed to the Iran nuclear deal, and he has so much support among Republic, uh, Republicans and Democrats, that the Israeli president came to the U.S. Congress and gave a speech against the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, it was unbelievable. Can you imagine the leader of any foreign country coming to our country and coming to the Congress to give a speech against the president? But that's how much power Israel has. They have the right. If they don't approve of a deal that America makes, um, you know, they can send their president to come and speak in our Congress and tell us that the president is wrong. I mean, it, it, unbelievable, right? No other country would be allowed to do this. But the president of Israel was brought to give a speech that was televised. It was on CNN and Fox News. And he gave an anti-Iran two-hour speech uh, opposing the Iran nuclear deal. Um, you know, unbelievable, utterly unbelievable. Um, and I mean, it just shows you, I and mean, there's Joe Biden sitting there behind him. Uh, I mean, it was just, just completely ridiculous. But the Iran nuclear deal went through and almost immediately the USA started putting new sanctions on Iran. Then Donald Trump got elected. And he said that Iran had violated the spirit of the agreement. What does that mean? Because Iran never violated the agreement. They never violated the agreement. Nothing that they ever did violated the deal, but they violated the spirit of the agreement. What the fuck does that mean? Right? You know, the, the feeling that you get from the agreement, they, they didn't go along with that. So Trump pulled the United States out of the Iran nuclear deal. And then Trump murdered Qasem Soleimani, the leader of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, right? Qasem Soleimani, we'll put his image, right? Qasem Soleimani, um, who is the leader uh, of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, who's like a celebrity in Iran, like the most famous hero of the Islamic Revolution. Qasem Soleimani, who is, you know, he was invited for a peace talk, for a peace negotiation in Iraq. He went to the negotiation, and as he was leaving, on his way to the airport, the United States murdered him with a drone. It was a cowardly act. They basically shot Qasem Soleimani in the back. This is the most beloved figure in Iran, and they murdered him, right? Um, this guy was the number one enemy of ISIS. No one had killed more ISIS fighters than this guy. Right. He was the national celebrity of Iran, the leader of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, and they didn't even kill him on the battlefield. They killed him. He went to negotiate a deal with uh, with with in Iraq. And as he was going to the airport to fly back to Iran, they droned his car and murdered him. A completely cowardly act, a cowardly act. But Donald Trump did it while he was being impeached. Um, Donald Trump was facing impeachment at the time. Um, and many people believe that Trump did it to avoid being impeached. Uh, they basically said, we'll remove you from office unless you give Israel a really nice gift right now. And so it, Trump murdered in an act of cowardice, murdered the top Iranian general, the, the national hero of Iran, a cowardly, cowardly act. Um, in response to the murder of Qasem Soleimani, Iran shot a lot of missiles at U.S. bases. And that was it. Um, you know, they they shot a lot of missiles at U.S. bases um, and, and the U.S. didn't retaliate and it was over. Um, but at that point, the people of Iran are saying, look, we elected Rouhani, right? You know, uh, we elected Rouhani because he said he was going to make the economy of Iran better. Right? They elected Rouhani because he was supposed to improve things. He was going to make a deal with America, and that was supposed to make everything better. And it very, very clearly did not happen. Rouhani, everything that Rouhani promised failed. Right, He said that they were going to make a deal with America and the economy would get better. It didn't. They got more sanctions. He said that America would be less hostile to Iran because of the deal. The USA murdered Qasem Soleimani. Uh, so everything, everything that Rouhani promised failed. So Rouhani lost the election. He got out of office in a landslide. And Iran elected Riazi. 
Riazi. Um, and Riazi is a hardliner. The current president of Iran, Ibrahim Riazi, he is a hardliner. Um, he's from the hardliner camp. And he, at this point, uh, he is the president. He's the new president. And he says, I'm not going to fuck up like Rouhani did. I'm not going to make the mistakes that Rouhani made, right? Rouhani, uh, he tried to negotiate with America and he played Mr. Nice Guy with America and pff, didn't it, it didn't work, right? Um, it, I mean, it, you know, uh, so look, what I've got no choice, right? And so Riazi uh, has said he wants to make friends with Russia. He wants to make friends with China. He doesn't even want to bother trying to reestablish relations with the United States. Meanwhile, the Biden administration kind of wants the Iran nuclear deal to come back. Uh, they did unfreeze. And this is, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate sometimes I, I try to ignore people in the chat who troll, but I actually do appreciate this one. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this one because this one's actually important. Right. And, and I mean, if anybody, this is, this is good. I'm sorry. Let me just, I got to scroll up here, scroll up. God, it's so hard to scroll up on StreamYard. scroll up, scroll up, scroll. No, don't click. Just scroll up. Goodness gracious. It's hard to scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Okay. All right. So somebody said Sleepy Joe gave Iran $6 million. That's false. South Korea stole $6 million of Iran's money. Iran had a bank account in South Korea and the U.S. government went to South Korea and said, freeze that bank account. That's what happened. Okay. Um, and so South Korea froze $6 million worth of Iranian money. Six million dollars, let me add, is not that much money for a government. For me or you, that would be huge. We could live for the rest of our lives on six million dollars. But for a government, six million dollars is not that much money. However, right, it was Iran's money and South Korea stole it. it was six billion dollars. Okay, that's a little bit more. Billion dollars, right? Six billion dollars. Okay. It was six billion dollars, but it was their money. South Korea stole it and froze it. Yes, yes, I was like six billion dollars. South Korea stole it and froze it, right? Um, and the Biden administration made some kind of deal with Iran, and so South Korea unfroze the money, okay? That is not giving Iran $6 billion. That's unstealing $6 billion that Iran already had, okay? Um, and I, I hear these lies all the time. Right. Iran, you know, they're always about to get a nuclear bomb, even though they've never taken a single step toward getting a nuclear bomb. They don't want a nuclear bomb. Their constitution forbids getting a nuclear bomb. I mean, it's like, but if you, you watch American TV, they're always just about to get a nuclear bomb. They've never once tried to get a nuclear bomb. It goes against their entire ideology uh, to, to get a nuclear bomb. So that's just a lie. Right. Um, and just like this, like, oh, Biden just gave Iran six billion dollars. No, no. He unstole six billion dollars that was stolen from Iran. He he rescinded the six billion dollar theft. Okay, um, you know. So I mean, they just they lie about Iran all the time, all the time, and they get away with it because no one dares defend Iran. And this is how they they create. You know, you know. It's like if you point this out, they go, "Oh my God, are you defending Iran?" I mean, it's like you can't have a rational conversation about this. So under these circumstances. Iran is the center of resistance to anti-imperialism or to imperialism in the Middle East, right? So they make a big deal about the fact that Iran supports the Palestinians. And they do. They, they do. But a lot of people support the Palestinians. But Iran also supports the people of Bahrain. And Bahrain is a country that has a Shia Muslim majority. But it's occupied by Saudi Arabia. And a king, who is a puppet of the United States, is forced on Bahrain. Um, and Iran supports the people of Bahrain in their fight for democracy against Saudi Arabia. Iran supports the Houthis in Yemen. And they are the biggest source of inspiration for the Houthi revolutionary movement, Ansar Allah, right? You know, Hussein al-Houthi was inspired primarily by, by the Islamic Revolution of Iran and Khomeini. Um, Iran supports Hezbollah in Lebanon. And Hezbollah 
you know, is a key militia based in Lebanon. Iran is the main reason that the Syrian government has stayed in power. They defeated ISIS and the terrorists, and the Syrian government got support from the Iranian Revolutionary Guards and from the, the Hezbollah militias and etc. Iran also supports the Shia Muslims of Iraq um, and has built a lot of support for the Shia Muslims of Iraq. And that at this point, the forces that are aligned with Iran that have a Khomeiniist worldview, they are the center of the resistance to U.S. imperialism and Israel in the Middle East. And no one can deny that. Now, they call themselves the axis of resistance. The axis of resistance. That's the term that they use to describe themselves. Um, and they call for the unity of all Muslims against U.S. imperialism and against Israel. Um, and they are anti-imperialists. And they're doing it. And in the name of not capitalism, but Islam, neither East nor West. One thing that I think is very inspiring um, is the relationship between Iran and Venezuela. Um, Venezuela is a socialist country in Latin America. Iran is an anti-imperialist revolutionary country. They call it not capitalism, but Islam. These Iran and Venezuela have become extremely close in the last couple years um, because they're both subject to horrendous sanctions imposed by the United States. And Iran is sending food to Venezuela. Uh, and Iran and Venezuela are cooperating to support their oil industry. And there are two countries that could not get closer. Um, and, you know, these are two different cultures. One's in Latin America. One's in the Middle East. One is, you know, they're, they're you know, Latin, Latin folks. The other, uh, they, are, um, they are Persians. Um, but they, they have certain similarities. Number one, they both have a huge amount of oil. And their revolutions have been about public control of oil, right? The Khomeini and the Islamic Revolution was about taking control of Iran's oil and using it for the Iranian nation. Venezuela's revolution was also about public control of oil, using it for the revolution. Both of them are not Marxist-Leninist, right? Um, you know, Maduro, uh, he's a Bolivarian socialist. He's a Roman Catholic and a Christian. He draws from Marxism, but he's not a Marxist-Leninist. He's not a member of the Communist Party. Uh, you know, Iran, they are not capitalism, but Islam. They reject Marxism. They're Shia revolutionaries, but they support China. They support Russia. They support Cuba and North Korea, and they're aligned with the communist governments of the world. Um, and they they reject capitalism, and they, they're, they, they very much acknowledge that their revolution came out of, of, of the wave of anti-colonialism during the post-World War II years and the Cold War that was inspired by communism. So both of them are like not Marxist, Leninist, and communist, but they're influenced by it. Both of them are very religious. Both of them have oil and have used state control of oil to build up their independent state-run economy. And these two countries are very, very close to each other, Iran and Venezuela. And I think that's very, very interesting. So... Um, you know, we're heading towards the two hour mark here. I've been talking for a long time, but this is something that's very important to me because I've spent a lot of time in Iran. Um, you know, I have met multiple presidents of Iran, right? I interviewed the president of the Islamic Republic of Iran last September when he was at the United Nations, Riazi. I've met Ahmadinejad. I showed you my picture with him. Um, you know, I've met, you know, Javid Zarif. I, I've made a whole documentary film about Iran and what the Iranian system and what Iran is like. Um, this is all very important to me. So I'm trying to control my emotions and I'm trying to just kind of talk about this in a, a way to explain the facts for people who may not know all this stuff. Um, but I'm very concerned about the future and I'm very concerned about what's happening because it looks like there's going to be a direct confrontation between Iran and Israel at this point. Um, it looks like Iran and Israel are going head to head. Um, and I'm concerned about this. Um, you know, I'm concerned about what this could mean, um, you know, for the world. And I, I, I'm concerned about, you know, if this could mean World War III or, you know, what this could result in, right? And I, I'm worried about this. 
But at the end of the day, right, and I want you to understand this, imperialism is the main threat to humanity. Capitalism, the system of production organized for profit, has entered the stage of imperialism, where the rule of the world by big banks and corporations is actively holding back development. And the reason that countries like this, you know, these two countries, Iran, I, I got rid of the picture, but Iran and Venezuela, the reason that they're so close to each other, despite having a different background and a different ideology, is because they have both broken out of that system in order to develop, right? That is what defines them. They have broken out of capitalism and imperialism in order to have development, to raise their people up out of poverty and build hospitals and schools and bring literacy to their population. That's what they're fighting for. The Iranian revolution, the Islamic revolution, the Bolivarian revolution, the Venezuelan revolution were both revolutions for economic development. And that's what the Houthis are fighting for also. And that's what the Chinese Communist Party was fighting for back in the 1930s. That's what they're still fighting for in developing China. And that's what Russian President Vladimir Putin, he fixed Russia's economy and developed development. People don't want to stay poor. But we have a sinister group of evil people that have taken power in Wall Street and in London, and they are determined to keep the world poor so that they can stay rich. They want to reduce the population. They want to reduce consumption. They want to grind the world into poverty so that they can stay at the top of, their, of, the, of the world. And that is the main threat to humanity. Imperialism is the main threat to humanity. And I am at the point that I question, I am, I am not a traditional Marxist. I am a Christian. Uh, I, I admit that the Soviet Union had a lot of flaws, but I know that imperialism is the main danger and that some kind of non-capitalist society has been the only way countries have been able to break free from imperialism. Whether you call it, whether it's a Marxist-Leninist government or Baathist Arab socialism or Bolivarian socialism or Shia Islamic, uh, you know, the, the Shia Islam, Islam, not capitalism, but Islam, whatever it is, the only way that countries are able to break free from the imperialists and develop is with breaking out of capitalism and imperialism. And the only hope for America, for my country, is if we do the same thing here. And what the Center for Political Innovation advocates doing is developing a form of anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism that is uniquely American. In China, they call their system socialism with Chinese characteristics. What we need in America is socialism with American ca characteristics. Maybe it's not capitalism, but Christianity. Maybe it's it's uh, Washingtonian socialism or link, link. I don't know what you want to call it. But there's got to be a uniquely American formation through which the people all across this country who are losing their jobs and losing their homes and losing their schools and struggling, these that has to be the basis of forming a movement here in America to oppose imperialism. And that is what is urgently, urgently needed, right? And it's not enough to just talk on the internet and it's not enough to build a social media brand. We need a real network of people who can move to build up anti-imperialism and working class anti-imperialist sentiment among the American people. We need to build an anti-monopoly coalition here in America. We need to move toward developing some form of American socialism to oppose imperialism. That is what we need. And that's what I'm for. And that's what the Center for Political Innovation is for. So I am going to put on some music. This is a song called Tomorrow is a Highway by Pete Seeger. Um, I'm going to put it on. Uh, this is a, a guy playing it on his piano. Then we're going to do the roll call. Then I'll answer your super chat questions. So we got five super chats that have come in. Uh, if people want to send more. Oh, and then there's one. Uh, there's also a, a rumble rant from Chow Chow Kathy. And I'll answer people's questions and then we'll call it a night. Um, you know, it's, it's almost, it's exactly two hours now, but that's okay. This is all important stuff. I hope I'm giving you context for world events. So here we go.
locations names and locations i will call you all out as i see you names and locations names and locations who is with us tonight names and locations who's with us names and locations names and locations um names and locations who's with us all right we got rice from adelaide australia frazier in the united kingdom alex rickle in oregon tyler in missouri uh we got Seneca in South Carolina, Emperor Penguin in Texas, Nate in Chicago, Jenny in Cincinnati, Colin in Greensboro, Patch in Arizona, Ryan in Kansas City, Albert from Illinois. Uh, I like the music of Utah Phillips, Alex in Brazil, uh, Io Hillary in New York City. Um, oh, wow, we got to scroll up. We got a bunch just went by. Oh, my goodness. Uh, John McCarthy in Chicago. Good to have you. Mariah in North Carolina, Paul in Charlotte. All right, scrolling up. Uh, um, all right, we got Ryan in Kansas City, Patch in Arizona, Albert in Illinois, um, Blake in Alabama. We got Tampa, Florida, Chris in West Virginia, Jamie in St. Paul, Justin in Townsville, Australia, Herb Bryant in Tampa, Florida, Anthony in Detroit, Chris in West Virginia, um, Ray from Jamaica. Welcome, Ray. Um Good to have you all with us. Names and locations. Names and locations. Um, uh, we got uh, Io Hillary in New York City. Dustin Schlesinger in Cleveland. Bob in Troy, New York. Sydney in Australia. We got D Wonders in Tennessee. We got the Republic of Texas. Me Hutch. Sherry in Cape May. Welcome, welcome. Um, Montreal, anti-imperia in Montreal. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Sri Lanka, welcome, welcome, welcome. 
uh, Montreal. All right. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit the notifications bell. Uh, we got Kiwi Corner in Auckland, New Zealand. American Spring in the Pacific Northwest. Northwest. Alan Cochran in Utah. They're on the Rumble. Um, and on Hemp Car, we've got Jacob from Wisconsin. He's on the Rockfin. Um, very, very, very good. Um, so we got Greg in Newcastle, Australia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, all right. Now, folks, um, uh, I um, uh, I do want to mention uh, that uh, these streams, uh, I'm able to do them because I have an extra room here in my New York City apartment where my rent is way too damn high. Um, and, uh, I do, you know, you, you've sent five super chats. I do appreciate all of them and I'm going to answer them. There's a rumble rant also, uh, there's a, a rock fin tip to answer, but if you send super chats, you're helping me pay my rent. Uh, you're helping support this independent work that I do. Um, and I really would appreciate it if people would send more super chats, get me talking the last couple of nights we've gone for three hours because I'm answering so many people's questions and that's awesome. Um, so anything you can do to support the work that I do, you can also sign up on the Patreon. You could buy some of the books that I've, I've written. Um, that all supports, uh, me and enables me to continue doing these streams. Uh, I do appreciate the support. Um, I do want to make clear, I do not make money from the center for political innovation. And at this point, I do not have access to CPI's funds in any way. I do not control those bank accounts. So if there's any concern, if you want to support the work of CPI, if you're a CPI member, um, if you, you know, if you, you know, if you are donating to CPI, good. I, great. CPI does great work, but because there's been some innuendo, I have no access to those funds. CPI is separate from me. If you support me here with Super Chats, you're supporting me personally. Uh, you're supporting my ability to rent uh, this apartment with this extra room. You're uh, you're supporting my ability to get on here and stream for you and and churn out the content that you all like. That's what you're supporting. So, um, you know, I would appreciate uh, super chats. They they help me do what I'm doing. Not a question, but a statement. You have to forego names and locations because you had 500 people watching live tonight at some point. Yay. Well, hey, I, I do my best. I do my best. Uh, and thank you, Herb Bryant. And so now I'm going to start answering people's questions. The first question I'm going to answer is going to be the Rumble rant uh, from Chow Chow Kathy. I think Chow Chow Kathy got skipped the other night. I do apologize, Kathy. I missed one of your super chats, but tonight I won't. So have you heard of the book Fragile Empire? How Russia fell in and out of love with Putin. If so, what are your thoughts? Can you recommend any other books on Putin? Well. I, I got to tell you, I, if you go to Barnes and Noble, you go to an American bookstore, you can find a lot of books on Putin and they're crap. I mean, they're just crap. And I, I, I don't know, you know, it, it, it frustrates me. I am thinking that I may write a book about Putin uh, because it's like nobody is allowed to say anything good about Russian President Vladimir Putin. Right. And um, some of those books do have interesting information in them. Right. I read a book called Putinism, which was a very anti-Russian book, but it talked about the ideology. Uh, I talked about Dugan and, and other people and their, their, the ideology of Putin. And I read a, a, a book that was about the Nashi youth programs in Russia. And I found that book at Barnes and Noble. And it's kind of a, an obscure book, but it was randomly on the shelf at Barnes and Noble. And I actually learned a lot about Russia's youth camps. But it was written in a very hostile way. There's two books that are less hostile than others, but I don't even really want to recommend these books, to be honest, because these books, um, you know, this book is The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein. Now, this book explains the disaster of the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, it's called The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. And it, it goes into great detail about how bad Russia was in the 90s and how Putin fixed it. But Naomi Klein can't say that without a bunch of little digs at Putin. And she also says a lot of things about China in this book that are just not true. Um, so this book is a very good source for economic, the economic data, the numbers in this book are very good. Uh, but she can't say it because she, she's an American academic. She can't say it without smearing Russia. And there's another book. I don't, it might be here on the shelf. Um, I don't, 
I used to have a copy of it. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. Again, this book is also very good at showing economic data, but it also smears Russia, right? It And this book is called Europe Since 1989 by Philip Thayer, and it's about economics. Um, and it talks about the fall of the Soviet Union, how Putin fixed the country since the fall of the Soviet Union, etc. Lots of very good, useful information, but a lot of nasty digs at Russia. Now, Dan Kavalik. Dan Kavalik is my friend. Uh, I love Dan Kavalik. I'm going to be speaking on a panel with Dan Kavalik this Friday. I'm going to an event. I'm going to be honored by the U.S. Friends of the Soviet People. And it looks like it's going to be it's going to be a super panel. I hope there's video of it afterwards. It's going to be me, Dan Kavalik, and Grover Fur. Um, we'll be speaking at an event sponsored by the uh, U.S. Friends of the Soviet People on Friday night. And it's going to be at Arrow Park in, in Monroe, New York. I don't know if it's a public event. It's not being publicized. I think it's more of a by invitation only thing. But I hope there's video afterwards because that's going to be a hell of a panel. And I'm working on my speech. I'm going to be speaking about Stalin, um, you know, and about, about you know, what we can learn and et cetera. And Grover is going to speak and Dan is going to speak. Um, I'll audio record it at minimum, at least at the very least, I'll have my phone and I will make an audio recording. Um, but I hope that there's a, 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 it would be really great if there was a professional video of that event, because I mean, that's going to be like a dream team panel if I do say so myself. But Dan Kavalik, he wrote a book, The Plot to Scapegoat Russia. Um, and that is very good. Um, that's going to be very, very, very good. Uh, that's a very, very good book. So um, I would recommend that book as well. Um, but a lot of the books that are published about Russia are, are just crap. And even the two I just recommended are not very positive. I mean, they, they have positive economic info. Uh, Dan Kavalik's writings I recommend. Um, but I need to write a book about Russia. And that's on my list of things to do. Write a book about Russia. Uh, write a book about Putin. Uh, and I feel like now that I've I've had the chance to talk to him, I've been in the same room as him before. But this, you know, this last time in Russia, I had the opportunity to actually ask him a question. I feel like now now um, might be the time to do it. I don't know. I need to talk to people. And I've got so much on my plate. We got our national retreat. We're trying to finish the textbook for that. And I mean, but, you know, it might be time to write a book about Russia. We shall see. Um, that's on my list of things. It, it may be necessary um, to do that. So we'll see. Um, but there you go. There you go. Uh, I hope that that answer, uh, was helpful to you. Chow, chow, Kathy. Um, but yeah, those are the, the books that I would recommend. Um, there you go. Um, you know, um, yeah, there you go. All right. So now, um, okay. So then Rockfin, we had a couple Rockfin, uh, questions that came in. Isn't Iran the safest place for Jewish people with the second largest Jewish population? That's true. In Iran, you are allowed to be Jewish. Uh, you just can't be pro-Israel. It's illegal to be pro-Israel because Israel is their enemy. Uh, but there is a Jewish population in Iran. Uh, I've been, I've seen Iran. They have coach, kosher butcher shops and synagogues, etc. cetera. Um, also, uh, and Hempkar is asking, says they have sex changes in Iran. That's true. Um, you know, that's interesting. Iran is pro-transgender, but not the way we are in the West. And this is a really, really important thing to understand. Um, in Iran, uh, you can, you can be transgender. Um, and in fact, they, people from all over the world go to Iran to get sex change operations. Uh, Iran is like Cuba where they have free medical school. And so a lot of Iranians are trained to be doctors. Um, and they have kind of an over, you know, an, an, an overabundance of doctors. And so a lot of Iranians go to, or, or a lot of people go to Iran to get nose jobs. Whenever you're in a hotel, a foreign hotel in Iran, there's a bunch of women with bandages on their nose because they went there to get nose jobs because nose jobs in Iran are very cheap. And, you know, cosmetic surgery, uh, which, you know, sex change operations are in the same category as cosmetic surgery is very cheap in Iran. And so Iran practices that. However, this is the important thing. In Iran, um, transgender is allowed. Uh, the Ayatollah, the supreme leader of Iran, has said that there are people that are stuck in the wrong body, and God loves those people, and they should be able to transition. Um, but there's none of this intersex stuff. You In Iran, you're a man or a woman, period. Uh, there's no in-between. There's no, today I feel like a woman, today, none of that, right? In Iran, 
you can change if you're a man, you can change to being a woman, but then you use the women's bathroom, then society treats you as a woman, then you dress with a headscarf as a woman does. You're a woman, period. And if you're a woman, you can change to being a man, but at that point, you're a man and you serve in the military and society treats you as a man and you go to the men's bathroom and you don't touch a woman unless you're married to her and you're a man, right? Um, and so they're pro-trans, right? You can go and get your surgery, but you have to be one or the other, which is very different than the transgender movement. Iran is not breaking down the concept of gender. That's that's not what they're doing. That's very interesting. See, in America, I've even seen t-shirts people wear that say gender is over, et cetera, right? Well, in Iran, they the transgenderism is widely accepted and widely allowed, but you can only be one or the other. And that's the difference. Um, now, I have heard people claim, I do not know if, you know, first of all, let me just get this out of the way, right? According, I've been there, I've talked to people, I know this for a fact, but also according, the New York Times will back me up on this, they do not kill gay people in Iran, okay? And anyone who tells you they kill gay people in Iran is lying to you. They do not kill gay people in Iran. It is illegal to be gay in Iran, um, and it is also illegal to commit adultery in Iran. However. In order to convict someone of that crime, all right, we'll get a little R-rated here. In order to convict somebody of homosexuality, and in order to convict somebody of adultery, there have to be four witnesses. And those four witnesses have to have actually seen the penetration happen, right? In Iran, technically, you cheat on your wife, you can get the death penalty. However, there have to be four people who saw the other woman get penetrated. And the same goes for goes for homosexuality. You can get the death penalty in theory for homosexuality, but there have to be four people who watched the penetration happen. Um, and then they can testify against you in court. There have to be four witnesses who testify that they saw the penetration happen. And then they have to then explain why they did not try to stop you which is a crime. And they also have to explain why they were watching, which is not, you know, doesn't put them in very good light. So no one has ever gotten the death penalty for being gay in Iran because to convict somebody for being gay in Iran is pretty much impossible, right? Um, you know, it's just impossible. Now there is a lesser charge um, that, that if you make a, uh, if a man makes a pass on another man, Right. Uh, or uh, that there's a name for that. It's like lewd behavior or something like that. And that's punishable by a fine, um, you know. And so that is enforced. But there are certain areas in Iran uh, where that law is not enforced. And in Tehran, there is a, a neighborhood that is known as the gay neighborhood where there is an understanding that police don't bother it. And it's known there's, you know, gay bars and gay whatever. Um, you know, and there's just certain neighborhoods that are known in Tehran and other cities to be gay hangouts and all of that. Um, but there was a, 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 a photograph that was going around when I was in college and it had two guys hanging. And it said uh, that these guys were hanged for being gay. Well, they weren't hanged for being gay. They were hanged for rape. They raped a 13 year old boy. Together, they grabbed a 13 year old boy. They held a knife to his throat and they they both raped him. And they got the death penalty for that. And they do use the death penalty in Iran very liberally for drug dealing. Um, they execute drug dealers in Iran um, and murderers and rapists. Uh, you know, uh, if you rape a woman who who and you take her virginity from from her. Right. Uh, that is the death penalty, I believe. Um, if you uh, if you murder somebody um, and interestingly, the murder thing. And this is interesting. And this is a traditional Islamic way of doing things. So if a member of your family is murdered, you're, you get to decide if they get the death penalty, uh, which is interesting. The family of the victim gets to decide. And often the family will um, not have the person get the death penalty in exchange for money, um, right? That, that they'll, they'll ask you know, the family of the murderer to give you know, large sums of money, and then they will not ask for the death penalty. Um, but if, 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 if one of your family members is murdered, the family of the murderer, um, you know, the family of the victim gets to decide, uh, if the death penalty is enforced. Um, you know, uh, so that's, 
That's another thing. I'll answer that. I'll answer that. Um, you're on the list, Mihach. Don't worry. Um, so, you know, and they do execute drug dealers in Iran, uh, drug importers. And that's because the drug gangs are known to put guns at people's heads and say, work with us or we kill you. So the government has to have the same threat. That's, that's what it's about. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, Iran, you know, it, I mean, it's not a free and open society in the same way the United States is. I mean, but that's because they're under very different circumstances. They're fighting for their lives. They're raising their country up from poverty. Um, you know, um, you know, it's a different, it's in different circumstances. So, you know, um, you know, I mean, there you go. Um, but yeah, but anyone who says, oh, in Iran, they kill all the gay people. That's Saudi Arabia. They kill all the gay people. Saudi Arabia, they throw gay people off of tall buildings or they cut their heads off and all that. Not in Iran. Not in Iran. All right. Um, anyway. Okay. All right. Um, one of the aid workers Israel murdered was an American. And where's the outrage? All right. Same with Rachel Corey. No one even knows Rachel Corey's name, right? Israel murdered Rachel Corey, who was an American activist who was in, acting in solidarity uh, with the Palestinians. And Israel ran her over uh, with a with a, a uh, with a bulldozer and killed her. Uh, an Irish American woman uh, from the state of Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, an Irish American woman from Oregon was bulldozed to death by the Israelis, um, and no one ever talks about that, you know, and where's the outrage about that, you know, but you can bet if there's anyone, if when Iran retaliates against Israel, any of those people who were killed have American passports, it'll be Iran got away with killing Americans. Well, Israel killed an American earlier and Israel already killed this American and no one seems to care. Well, we care, we're activists, but uh, the Zionists and the mainstream US media doesn't care. Taiwan is refusing help from the People's Republic of China after the earthquake. What fucking idiots. I mean, I mean, that is unbelievable, right? That's about the same as after Hurricane Katrina. America refused aid from English-speaking Cuban doctors, right? Cuba's right there in the Gulf of Mexico, 90 miles south of Florida. They got hundreds of English-speaking doctors ready to go to New Orleans and help people. And America's like, no, we don't want any help from the commies. We don't want any communist doctors, right? You know, communist doctors can't can't, you know, heal bones. Oh no, we can't. I mean, it's, it's uh, ugh, frustrating. You know what I mean? It's, it's completely frustrating. Um, you know, and this is, I mean, yeah, you, you don't want, yeah. It's like, they're afraid that, that people on Taiwan will meet people from China who are providing the aid and realize they're the same people and not go along with you, us provocations. Taiwan is part of China and I mean, that's unbelievable. And if I was on Taiwan and I had just gotten into an earthquake and I found out my government was, you know, it was a huge wealthy country. The second largest economy in the world is right there on the Chinese mainland. And they're offering to help us out. And my government is saying, nope, we don't want your, your I mean, I would be outraged. All right. But we also know and the USA has a plan that if China retakes the island of Taiwan, the USA will bomb all of Taiwan's uh, computer chip factories. Did you know that? So if, if China moves into Taiwan, the US is so determined to make sure China doesn't get those computer chip factories that the Americans have a plan to bomb Taiwan while China is retaking it. Can you make this up? You can't make this up. You cannot make this up. It's so unbelievable. But that's what it means to be a friend of America. That if China retakes Taiwan, America will blow up all of Iran's chip factories or all of Taiwan's chip factories. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. What role will Russia play, if any, as Israel escalates a world war? I mean, Russia has relations with Israel. But I mean, at this point, Russia and Israeli relations are pretty low. Right. I have never seen Russia be more pro-Palestinian than it is now. In the past, there's been times where Russia is very, very pro-Israel, but not not now, not these days. So there you go. Russia has had a measured response with re Ukraine. Why wouldn't Iran take a similar approach with Israel? Well, I hope, I mean, I hope they do. Um, and I hope that this doesn't escalate into World War III. I mean, but at the same time, Iran has to do something. You know, and I mean, Russia 
they had to go into Ukraine. I mean, you know, uh, they held off doing it for eight years, but it got to the point that if they didn't do that, they would have no credibility. They'd be endangering themselves. I mean, and that's Iran. If Iran just says, oh, yeah, you can blow up our consulate. You're sure you can just blow up our consulate. Um, you know, I mean, they have to do something. So there you go. I mean, it's it's a mess, but there you go. Wouldn't BRICS counsel Iran to show restraint in light of the rise of multi-imperialism? Well, I'm sure that Iran is on the phone with Russia, is on the phone with China, and is and the whole world is trying to make sure that Iran's response doesn't spark World War III. I'm sure that, that there are many back-channel communications going on and negotiations trying to figure out how Iran can maintain its credibility as a country and respond to what Israel has done. But at the same time, I mean, I mean, Iran, they can't, I mean, if, they, if Iran doesn't do something, it's going to be just open season on their embassies. I mean, any country in this circumstance has to do something, but you know, I mean, what can they do and it not lead to a new world war? That is the question, right? Um, so yeah. All right. Not a question, but a statement. You may have to forego names and locations because you had 500 people watching live tonight at some point. Yay. Well, hey, you know, I I am on here doing the best I can. And I've noticed that when I talk about international issues like Russia and China and Iran and stuff like that, the views tend to be, you know, large. When I'm talking more about political theory uh, or I'm talking about American politics, it's not as much, but that's okay. You know, I am going to keep trying to talk about a balance of things. I stream a lot um, and I appreciate everyone who watches. I hope that you subscribe. I hope you hit the like button. Um, I hope you hit, hit the notifications bell. Um, you know, but my focus, this social media outlet, this channel is dedicated to building um, a um, an, an anti-imperialist organization. Um that's what I'm dedicated to doing. I am about building the Center for Political Innovation, which is the organization that will lead the United States uh, in an anti-imperialist direction. That's what I am here to do. Um, so speaking of which, um, we are having our national four-day educational workshop coming up. Um, and so I, I'd love to have you there. I'd love to have you join us. Um, so I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, We'd love to have you there. It's in Vermont. It's four days, April 26th through the 29th. Um, you know, um, I'll drop the link uh, in the chat. Um, we'd love to have you there. Um, yeah, love to have you be there. Um, so join us. Um, it's going to be a great gathering. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, it's going to be four days of socialist education. Go ahead and register. So there's that. Um, also, so Chow Chow Kathy says, just for the info, three of the British volunteers killed were ex-military and employed by the intelligence agency. When they first came on the scene in Gaza, it seemed they were a U.S. op based on financial connections to the White House. I don't know what that means. Chow Chow Kathy, I'm going to have to look into that. Um, I'm going to have to look into that. Um, so I, I, I mean, there is, intelligence is a very strange world. Um, so... There you go. That's all I can say. Um, uh, intelligence is a very murky, strange world where there's all kinds of people in all kinds of different places, and it doesn't always make sense. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, that might be true. What you said, I haven't seen confirmation. I don't I mean, it's very likely that's true, but it could not be true. I don't know. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that, oh, this was all a big conspiracy or something. I mean, it could mean a lot of things. Um, so Herb Bryant, thank you for the super chat it is very appreciated. And, um, thank you for supporting the channel. How do you see the present and future of Cuba? Well, Cuba is adjusting its economy to be more like Vietnam. Uh, Cuba has also, uh, you know, at this point, their relationship with the United States has somewhat improved because Venezuela is more, is, is more the, the target is more the center of resistance. Uh, that said, you know, Cuba has a socialist economy. It's run by the Communist Party um, and they want to have more market reforms. They want to be like Vietnam or China, but the, the Communist Party is not going away. Right. Um, they're maintaining their socialist system, um, but they they've advanced. Right. You know, during the Cold War years, they had a Soviet style economy. 
Then they had the special period. They had the rectification campaign in the late 80s to solidify support for the Communist Party. Then they had the special period in the 80s. And now uh, they are moving toward, you know, reform and opening up. But they're not going to be overthrown. Um, and they are part of the anti-imperialist camp. And they are constantly adjusting their socialist system. And that's what they're learning. Right. The Soviet Union could not bend. So it broke. But Cuba is constantly evolving and adjusting its socialist system. And that's a strength. Um, I will say that Cuba needs oil, right? And Venezuela has provided them oil, but Venezuela, uh, you know, I mean, they need more oil. And that that you know, Cuba, they they have industrialized, they've electrified the country, but and things have gotten better. It's not as bad as it was in the '90s. In the '90s, things were very bad in Cuba, but you know, Cuba still, you know, they still need more development, and they still need more foreign investment. And uh, the U.S. blockade against them needs to be lifted. Um, you know. Um, absolutely needs to be lifted. Um, and, you know, I'll never forget, there was a protest, um, uh, you know, in New York City during the SOS Cuba. And all these people were protesting, saying they wanted to help the Cuban people, but they all supported the blockade. And I said, well, you don't really support Cuba if you support the blockade, um, you know. Um, so, you know, all the people, you know, the Miami crowd, those people, they don't really want to help Cuba, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's complicated. I believe in the communist party of Cuba. I think that they've done a lot. Um, I think Cuba has improved They treat LGBT people much better than they used to. Uh, they treat religious people much better than they used to, uh, on both of those issues. They really improved, uh, Cuba, you know, Cuba is a country that, uh, you know, they've, they've evolved and adapted and adjusted their socialism and they've come a long way and they're part of, you know, Bolivarian socialism in Latin America is largely a continuation of what Cuba started. Cuba, I mean, in terms of health care and raising the life expectancy and industrializing, they've had great achievements. So I admire the Cuban revolution. I don't know what more to say. All right. Um, all right. Um, and uh, thank you, Black in the Empire. I do appreciate the super chat. What about honor killings? Well, honor killings is a tradition, um, you know, that, that um, you know, that, that in the Islamic world, I think in general, um, it refers to, if I'm not mistaken, right, it, uh, it, that if a woman's, um, if a woman's, uh, you know, dignity is, is robbed, then she's, she's killed in order to preserve the honor of the family or something like that. Um, it's obviously a pretty barbaric practice. Um, and that's done in different parts of the Islamic world, different parts of the impoverished developing world, victims of rape, et cetera, um, you know, are, are killed, but that's, that's not, you know, that's not what the Islamic Republic of Iran is doing right now. Right. That may be something that is ugly, that is in their history. Um, you know, but I, that's not part of the culture of Iran at this time. Right. Um, you know, I think there were tribes in Iraq that were doing that. Um, I'll never forget that because, um, well, I anyway, I, I could tell you a story sometime, but, um, you know, I think there were tribes in Iraq that were doing that after the USA invaded Iraq. Uh, there was some chaos and there were some rural tribes that were doing something like that. Um, but that's not something that's coded into law, right? That's, you know, I mean, you know, it's basically revenge, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you know, in certain cultures, I mean, it's, you know, certain cultures and such, if, you know, if there's different practices like that, that are tribal, et cetera. Um, you know, um, but that's, that's not part of what's going on in Iran at this time. That's in the history of the Middle East and history. And most cultures, if you go back far enough, have traditions like that, right? That if your family is dishonored, you take revenge on the person perpetuating it, per perpetrating it or something. That's a different thing. That's, that's something else. All right. Um, can you believe it's still raining? Yeah, the rain has been pretty extreme here in my neighborhood. I, I mean, it's like, you know, what's I don't get it. In New York City, it's been just pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. Um, you know, it's been a rainy few days uh, in New York City, to say the least. Um, but that hasn't stopped me. I do make a point of trying to go outside every day a little bit, um, you know, just just to, um, you know, just to, to get some fresh air. I don't like being cooped up in the house too long. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, the rain is pretty unbelievable. It's been a pretty long rain in New York city. All right. 
Bush wouldn't let Gaddafi build hospitals for black Americans. You know, Gaddafi was always trying to help Americans in different ways. Um, he was trying to support the black community. He funded the Black Panthers. He gave them money. He funded the Nation of Islam. He gave them money. Um, at one point, uh, I believe the Blackstone Nation, which was a, a street gang, was alleged of uh, in Chicago, was alleged to have gotten funding from Gaddafi. Um, you know, Gaddafi, he, he was using Libya's oil money as part of a global anti-imperialist effort. He supported the IRA. He's, you know, he supported the, um, you know, all kinds of resistance movements around the world. And, um, you know, Gaddafi was a great internationalist. He supported the, the, uh, Nelson Mandela and his struggle against apartheid in South Africa. Gaddafi, he made a point of using Libyan oil wealth to support global anti-imperialist causes. Um, and that's very admirable. Um, so there we go. Black in the empire. Uh, thank you. And Elena, thank you. I appreciate both of you supporting the channel. Um, yeah, we, uh, we didn't go a full three hours tonight, which is good because it gets a little long. Uh, but we, we went over a lot of important material. I do thank everyone for the, the super chats to support the channel. I'll be back. Uh, maybe tomorrow night, maybe not, uh, definitely won't be on here Friday. Cause that's when I'm doing the panel with Grover and, uh, and with Dan Kavalik, but, um, I'll probably be back on Saturday. Um, so, uh, yeah, I wish you all the best. Um, I'm going to put on the closing music. Um, all right, cool. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's been fun. I'll be back soon. Uh, it's been a good stream. It's been a good stream. New upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today.